Welcome everyone to the Marin Energy Authority all-day retreat. Uh, we have a very ambitious agenda today. Good seeing everyone this morning. Um, why don't we start out with board announcements, item one. Doesn't look like we have any. Uh, item two is public open time. Any members of the public wish to be heard on a matter not on the agenda? Okay, it looks like none there as uh, well. So item three, report from Executive Officer Don. Great, I just had um, one announcement this morning. Uh, since we had a board meeting last week, we uh, covered a lot of ground there. Um, but I wanted to welcome our new clerk who's joining us today for her first day of work. This is Darlene Jackson. Um, welcome, Darlene. Please give her a warm welcome. She's going to be here. <laughs> She'll be working um, with a lot of you all, um, a lot of the board members, um, helping with preparations for board meetings and that sort of thing. So uh, be on the lookout for emails coming your way from Darlene and uh, lots of other good things to come. And then I also wanted to announce the exciting news that we've also uh, selected uh, a person to fill our energy efficiency coordinator position. Um, her name is Becky Minton and she'll be starting on Thursday. That's it for my report. Great, thanks. Item four, annual review. Um, I'm going to start here with, with uh, kind of an overview of the year. And um, we have a couple of other key staff here with me that are going to be uh, jumping in during parts of this overview. We also have Paul Soko here from Noble Energy Solutions, who's traveled up from San Diego to be with us today. He's going to um, take the tail end of this presentation to share with you some of the work that Noble does with um, ranking energy, really crucial work. So um, the first exciting event of the year, uh, going back since our last retreat, is that we have four new member agencies. And we're, we're so excited um, that we've been able to grow in this way. We added Puerto Madera, Larkspur, Novato, and Ross late last fall. Uh, began, uh, your representatives began sitting on our board in January, and it's been such a pleasure to um, have all of Marin County represented here on the MCE board. The other um, exciting happening of the last year is the addition of the city of Richmond. So uh, lots of growth in the last year, and the um, addition of the city of Richmond is um, practically complete. We're just waiting for the final certification by the CPUC of the implementation plan that was submitted in early July, and that is expected within the next three weeks. So um, we believe that our November board meeting will be the, the first board meeting where we have a Richmond representative joining us. Really excited about that. Um, we also conducted a good deal of public enroll and public enrollments, offering service to all the remaining um, jurisdictions um, throughout Marin. So growing or all the remaining jurisdictions and all the remaining customers. So we grew from 14,000 customers to over 90,000 customers um, just in the last uh, month, and uh, it's been a, a pretty exciting uh, time for Marin Clean Energy. We have. Um, some key enrollments and opt-outs listed here, and we have over a thousand deep green customers, and we expect to see that number um, increasing incrementally in the coming years with a couple of um, plans that we have for customer engagement. Next slide. Now, I wanted to spend a moment talking about the Richmond enrollment because that's going to be a big part of um, what, what is coming before us in the next year. We're planning to enroll approximately 34,000 new customers, and uh, we expect to be offering <coughs> service to um, the city of Richmond through an enrollment process sometime in mid-2013. However, we're going to be offering service to uh, customers that are interested in the deep green energy product as early as November after the CPUC certification of the plan. So we're very excited about that. And in addition to offering electricity service in Richmond, we'll be offering our feed and tariff program. We're going to talk about our feed and tariff program a little bit later on today. We'd like to talk about expanding that program to Richmond because we believe there are some great sites out there for um, feed and tariff projects. Also, our net energy metering program will be available in Richmond, and our energy efficiency programs will be available in Richmond. In fact, uh, for customers that are opting in early to the Deep Green program in Richmond, they'll be eligible for our 2012 energy efficiency program. Currently, we don't have plans to expand into any other municipalities. 
um, although there are some other cities and towns in California that are exploring CCA and they're <coughs> reaching out to us for advice from time to time. So we'll be, um, we'll be uh, keeping you all abreast of any further discussions on that front. And now Justin is going to spend a moment um, talking to us about the breakdown of our membership. Yeah, I thought one thing that might be useful for us to understand our customer base better is to look at which customers we have. Uh, what do they look like? What rate schedules are they on? And how can that be useful as we move forward and try to set our rate schedules that will be happening sometime uh, in mid-2013? Uh, we have about 93,000 accounts right now. And it's worth noting that over 80,000 of those accounts are residential <laughs> accounts. That's about 87% of our total customer base. And almost all of those are what we call Res 1. Uh, pg e would refer to it as E1. It's the basic residential schedule. It does not have time of use periods. Customers are charged a flat rate for electricity no matter what time of day they use their electricity. Uh, the other 4% would be on various time of use rates. And some of those are gonna be net energy metering customers as well as people who believe that they can use less, less electricity during the day and then in exchange for that pay a lower price for electricity during the evening. Uh, we have over 11,000 commercial accounts. That's about 12% of our total customers. 86% uh, of those customers are COM1. Uh, similar to residential, it's a flat rate. It is seasonal though. Uh, customers pay a, a higher rate during the summer and a lower rate during the winter, uh, but it is not a time of use rate. Uh, one reason this is very important to note is that PG&E is actually going to be pushing uh, their commercial customers onto time of use rates uh, later this year and in 2013. Uh, one thing that may become a discussion in terms of, of rate setting is whether or not we want to uh, offer our customers the same time of use rates uh, for commercial customers. Uh, we would, when, when they transfer their basic commercial customers we will not have a comparable schedule for that, at least we don't right now. So it may be something that's worth considering. On the other hand, a lot of people are actually very frustrated that uh, commercial customers are being forced on to a uh, time of use schedule with PG&E later this year. And that's something that we're not compelled to do the same way PG&E is. Uh, one thing that's also worth noting is while I mentioned that 86% uh, of these customers are COM1, which is small commercial, uh, that's not proportionate to the actual electricity usage. There are certainly going to be uh, customers that are on larger commercial rate schedules that have a considerably higher usage than basic commercial customers. Uh, however, other rate schedules actually make up less than 1% of our total accounts combined. Uh, that includes agricultural customers, it also includes uh, street lighting accounts, and traffic control accounts. Uh, nearly 1,800 net energy metering customers right now are with Marin Clean Energy. That's about 2% of our ratepayer base. Uh, about 40% of these customers are actually not on time of use rates, which I thought, that was a surprising statistic to me. Uh, a lot of people who are net energy metering customers because they're generating their electricity during the day, they actually would prefer to be on a time of use rate. They get more credit for the electricity they're generating and then they pay lower rates on the electricity when they pull electricity off the grid at night. However, there are a number of other factors. Uh, I think one thing that sticks out in particular is a lot of people don't like being on a time of use rate and because they feel like the utility is dictating uh, when they can and can't use electricity. So I think because of that and other factors, that's why you see only about 60% on uh, time of use rates. And then our deep green customers, we're at about 1.3% enrollment in deep green now, now that we've enrolled the remainder of, of Marin County. Uh, that has pushed that percentage down. Uh, it's about 1,200 customers, and it certainly is uh, going up, and we've been having more enrollments in deep green. Great. Thank you, Justin. The next area we wanted to provide an overview of is our energy efficiency <coughs> programs. And as many of you all know, there's statutory language that enables community choice aggregators, uh, such as MEA, to administer public goods funds for energy efficiency programs. AB 117 and SB 790 both have language that allow us to operate such programs. 
we've developed a program for 2012 and then also a program for 2013-14. Uh, these are separate programs but um, build on each other. So the 2012 program is kind of a starting point and then starting in 2013-14 uh, we'll be um, growing the program in, in, into a much more broad and robust program. Um, both EE plans are innovative and target market sectors that have been underserved traditionally. They're also designed to complement and not replace or eliminate existing EE efforts that are offered by um, the IOUs and other partners of the IOUs. Um, what we're hoping is that the EE programs will benefit customers through long-term savings on energy bills and will also create work and training opportunities for um, economically underprivileged communities within our service territory. And we're also excited about the ability of these programs to reduce peak demand and, and have some impact on how we procure. The next slide, please. So this is a, a nice chart that helps you see what the similarities and differences are between the 2012 plan and the 2013-14 uh, plan. What you can see is that the multifamily component exists in, in both of the plans. The small commercial and single family components will be new additions for 2013-2014. And the on-bill repayment pilot, both of the financing elements, the on-bill repayment and the standard offer pilot, will both be in preparation in 2012, but will not be launched until the 13-14 cycle. Next slide. And here's some more detail about each of the sub-programs. So the multifamily program is really targeting a sector in Marin that has not yet been um, targeted for energy efficiency. So we think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there, a lot of untapped potential, and we'll be collaborating with local partner organizations, uh, leveraging local training programs to, to operate this program. And we're really excited about getting it started. Uh, we're actually in the early stages of starting it right now. The small commercial program is a multi-measure program that's going to be offering technical assistance, but also direct incentives, which means uh, cash to help with the installation of retrofits in small commercial buildings. We'll be targeting professional buildings, small grocers, and restaurants. Then the single family component, we're gonna actually have a presentation this afternoon where we learn more about this program, but the idea here is to complement programs that already exist and are being operated by the IOUs by looking at customers' behavior and trying to drive more energy and water savings and cost reductions through a software, web interface, and also grassroots community organizing where we can get friendly competitions set up between schools and neighborhoods um, using education and outreach to um, leverage existing programs like Energy Upgrade California. And then the financing element is going to include the on-bill repayment pilot program. We're working with an organization now that's going to have, going to um, offer the pilot to 250 moderate income single family homes in Marin and 250 uh, moderate single family homes in Richmond. And we're working with a bank to get the mechanics of that program put in place so that we can launch early next year. And then the standard offer for energy efficiency procurement is a program that we'll be developing in 2013-2014 on a pilot scale. Next slide. This is an overview of the budgets. So the 2012 plan, as you can see, has a budget that's just over 400,000. Um, you can see here, I think some of the, the interesting points in this budget are the direct incentives. You can see that that line item is about 124,000. Um, that will be going directly to folks that are implementing changes in multifamily buildings. Some of those will go to common areas, some will go into individual um, units, um, but there will be uh, some of both available. And then if you look at the 2013-2014 plan, you'll see that the, the budget there is just over four million. And there we have, uh, again, we have incentives coming in at just over a million. Um, and then uh, education and training is a, a important component of that plan as well that's um, shown there towards the bottom of the budget. So now we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the renewable purchases that have, that we have approved over the last year. And it's um, actually a couple of these were approved um, more than uh, prior to the, uh, the last retreat. But this is kind of a nice uh, overview of what we have under contract now. So 30 megawatts of new solar being developed for us by UNEXCO should be coming online in 2014. Uh, 15 megawatts of new solar that is scheduled 
um, to come online in 2013. We actually have a different location on that that's no longer, <coughs> looks like that's no longer going to be coming through in Placer County, but it will be in Kings County. Um, then we have 3.2 megawatts of new biogas that's scheduled to come online early next year in uh, Yuba and Solano counties. Um, as we've discussed with the board, we may be consolidating that into all of it coming from the Yuba location, and that should be coming, that information will be coming to your board in the next month or two. We have 4.8 megawatts of biogas coming from Gen Power Energy 2001. That's going to be sourced in Placer County. And then 20 megawatts of new solar that's being developed by RE Kansas in Kings County, and that should be coming online in 2016. Um, all of these, actually with the exception of the 4.8 megawatts of biogas, are long-term contracts. Um, oh, and actually the RE Kansas is a, a medium-term contract, but the, the three listed at the, at the top are 20 to 25-year contracts, um, so they'll be with us for quite a while. And then down at the bottom, we've listed some examples of the local solar procurement that is underway. Um, almost a megawatt of solar being developed right now as we speak in, at the San Rafael Airport. Uh, that should be coming online towards the end of this month. And then we have one megawatt of new solar carport shade structures that is looking like it's going to end up being built on the Buck Institute. And so we have um, plans underway there and discussion, contracting discussions um, around land, land use agreements are in, their, in, the, um, in process right now. We, we expect to have news on that within the next two months. And then it's also worth mentioning all of our customers who are generating solar power on their own rooftops. These are our NEMS customers. And um, we have uh, almost 2,000 of them generating solar power right here in Marin. And so that's, that's important to um, note as well. This next slide is a graphic showing you, kind of just so you can get a sense of where these resources are coming from and uh, what type of resources they are. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, later this morning talking about our resource plan, our integrated resource plan. And um, so this is a nice thing to keep in mind. This, this kind of shows where we are today, and soon we'll be talking about where we want to go in the coming years. And this slide shows some photos of the new 972 kilowatt uh, installation of solar that's going up at the Hertz Airport. These photos were taken just a couple of weeks ago, so you can see the panels going up. Um, you can see the, the workers actually doing the installation. One of the things that's really exciting about this installation is that it's um, the larger, largest solar project to date in Marin County. Um, it's, um, it's the first project that has come in under our feed-in tariff. It's a 20-year power purchase agreement, so this resource will be with us for quite a while. And it's, it will offset 750 tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. Um, it's, it's enough power for 280 homes for an entire year. Um, or if you want to count how much it's producing during peak production, it's serving the needs of 100, I'm sorry, 1,200 customers during peak energy production. We've been able to generate local jobs through this effort. The project is owned by the San Rafael Airport. It's designed by San Rafael-based REP Energy. It's installed, it's being installed by Muir Beach-based Synapse Electricity. And the jobs have um, come, the installation jobs um, came through a partnership with the Marin City Community Development Corporation uh, for the construction jobs. Um, you can see a photo there of um, some of the local folks uh, participating in the installation. We've also had efforts underway to give back and fund local programs in other ways. We provided $20,000 in energy efficiency and solar rebates to MCE customers this spring. Those have been used up, so we may need to reallocate in our next budget cycle if we want to continue that effort. Or we may be able to use our EE budget to help with that effort in our next budget cycle. We've also been continuing to get the installations completed in the five electric vehicle charging stations that we've been helping with in San Rafael, Tiburon, and San Anselmo. The San Rafael and Tiburon installations are complete, and the San Anselmo installation is still in progress. We've been able to support local community groups, nonprofits, and youth groups through sponsorships. That's part of our um, outreach and marketing. And then we also have the, uh, the local renewables that we just uh, talked about and the 
Future Energy Efficiency Programs, which we're going to hear a lot more about this afternoon. Now Beth is going to come up and talk just a little bit about our CPUC successes to date. Um, these are, this is just going to be a brief overview of some of the items that we've been talking about over the past year. Um, one of the, we've had a lot of successes at the Public Utilities Commission and our, our uh, involvement has been very extensive. We've been involved in many proceedings. Um, at any one time it's a little over a dozen proceedings that we're involved in at any one time. And it's, this is sort of a, this broad approach I think is, um, is creating a lot of benefits for us. I'll, I'll talk about some of our more targeted uh, our targeted work and then some of our broader work and the impacts of that. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the power charge indifference adjustment, which we discussed at our last board meeting. Um, that's the ongoing exit fee paid by departing load. Um, I'll skip over some of the points of the slide here since we talked about it at the last board meeting. But, we had entered into a consortium with a with a broad range of stakeholders, including direct access providers, energy suppliers, a, a, a lot of folks that had been interested in correcting the methodology used for calculating the PCIA for years. And um, through that joint participation of the commission, we ended up with three major revisions to the PCIA, which Justin is going to be discussing a little bit later on. One is the incorporation of a green adder, so to ensure that the above market costs of renewable power are compared against the cost of renewable power. And then also um, some more minor revisions regarding the shaping profile, which had a, had a small but important difference, and also the removal of um, California ISO costs. So that eliminated some double counting that was previously happening in the methodology. So that was a very significant win for us. It's a very significant win for our customers. Um, it, it's going to result in a lot of cost savings as Justin's going to discuss. Um, on the next slide, please. The broad approach that we've been taking, um, many times we're involved in items that maybe have a small economic benefit on an individual level. But overall, the result of our involvement has been a significantly greater visibility at the commission, much greater understanding of what CCA actually is, um, and how we can, how we can, what our role is in the electricity market. We, we are right now the highest um, percentage procurement of RPS in the state, and we have been really quite cutting edge. So even though we're small, we've had a significant impact. And so I think that a couple of places where we've seen this is um, in one of the energy efficiency fund decisions, the, the electric program investment charge, essentially the, that decision acknowledged that distribution funds should not be used for generation projects of the IOUs. And this was specifically in response to some comments that we had made. Now it seems like that should be <coughs> intuitive or obvious, um, but it, it really hasn't been explicit in decisions passed. So that, that's a great, um, that's, that's great for us moving forward that there's this level of understanding among administrative law judges, commissioners, staffers, energy division, you know, the, the, the understanding of, um, of CCA is really going sort of wide and deep at the commission. So I think this is, this is a great step forward. And then interestingly, in the economic development rate proceeding, the Division of Rate Care Advocates, which often focuses more on bundled customer issues, actually raised, independently raised issues regarding the anti-competitive impacts on CCA of this particular proposal by pg &E. And so now there are you know, other parties that maybe hadn't focused necessarily on all customers, but rather focused on bundled customers, um, that are now acknowledging uh, these CCA specific issues. And so I think that um, just the visibility aspect has been very significant. Um, one other component is, you know, with our, our consistent involvement at the CPUC is we just make sure that each program that we're seeing come through the system is fair for our customers. Um, this one was actually pretty straightforward one to work on. 
This is for virtual net energy metering, so folks who might not be able to have a solar installation on their house, but say you live in a shady spot, there are ways that you can access virtual net energy metering. Uh, the way that the resolution, so the commission decision was originally drafted, it would have only been available to bundled customers, but it's paid for through the distribution rate through the California Solar Initiative. Um, based on our involvement, we made that available to all customers, bundled and unbundled alike. And I'm actually going to skip over the next slide, um, because I, I believe that uh, Don has already talked on energy efficiency and we'll be hearing a lot about that. Um, but that's a major victory also at the commission. It, it is a new way for our, for our 2012 funding, that's a new way of accessing energy efficiency funds that hadn't previously been utilized. So I think that there's there's a lot to be proud of um, this past year, and uh, Justin's going to touch on the PCI population. So this is, this is just one brief slide here, and I'm gonna go over this, and then after this, I'll uh, turn it over to Paul Soko with Noble and has uh, quite a lot to add here. Uh, the PCIA recalculation and the refund, uh, this is a good way of illustrating what these legislative victories mean to me. Uh, what can you, regulatory victories mean. Uh, what exactly does the PCIA recalculation and refund look like? Uh, obviously, we, we collaborated with direct access groups, uh, other community choice aggregation groups, to try to see that this uh, rate, this PCAA charge, was calculated more accurately. Uh, the CPUC issued a decision in late 2011 that said, you're absolutely right, this is not being calculated correctly. We're going to calculate it the right way. Give us some time to figure it out. And not only that, but we're going to retroactively uh, refund overpayment into PCIA all the way back to uh, June of 2011. Well, the problem was is, getting that calculation method determined took quite a while. And we didn't get the new calculation method until uh, mid-2012. And then the once the new method was determined, pg and -E recalculated it and implemented it July. So we had an entire year where people were overpaying the PCIA. And that's a big deal. Uh, as a lot of people have talked about, one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest factor, in price difference between us and pg and &E is that PCIA fee. The good news is, here's what the refund looks like. Uh, the original PCIA for 2011 was nearly two cents per kilowatt hour for residential customers. The revised PCIA for those customers is about, uh, is, is, is a little over one-tenth of a cent. Uh, that's how much of a difference it is. It's a 91% reduction. Uh, the reduction for customers who have an older vintage is even bigger. For some customers, it's as much as a 94% reduction. So what that means is all that high PCIA that people were paying in 2011, they're getting 91 to 94% of that money returned to them in the form of a check from pg and &E. And those checks are going out, uh, they started going out, I think, a week or two ago, and they're going to be going out over, the, over this month as well. Uh, as for the 2012 PCIA, the reduction was substantially less. Uh, however, it's still a significant reduction. Uh, these are kind of some of the lowest reductions where you have about a 56% reduction for basic residential customers. Uh, customers under the rate schedules, customers in older vintages have a higher reduction. So what does this mean on a typical customer's bill? Uh, if you take these rates here and you apply them to a typical customer, 540 kilowatt hours in Marin, residential customer, they're getting a check back from pg e for about $100, close to $100. If it's a higher usage customer, 1,000, 1,500 kilowatt hours in their, a month, then they're looking at $200, $300 checks. So this is a very big deal. Um, we're, yes? So just in the case of so someone gets a check from pg e in the mail, they think pg and &E is being generous, as opposed to uh, the good work by the collaboration of the folks at the PUC. I'm just curious, yes, that's your, your perception of how that, that will go over. Well, that's a very good question, but we actually worked with pg and &E and and we've had a pretty good relationship on this issue and a few things recently, where we've been working with them to collaboratively write letters to customers that explain this. And so we, we worked on the letter they're sending all these customers along with this check that explains 
this was not calculated correctly, Marine Clean Energy protested this, and that's why you're getting this check. And PG&E cooperated. Yeah, actually, or is cooperating. Uh, we, we had pretty good cooperation with PG&E uh, on this letter in particular. Uh, they drafted it, ran it by us. Uh, we went over it, and they accepted our changes. So, um, yeah. So, so is every customer that's been with MEA, MCE since the beginning going to get a check? Uh, well, we, and my understanding is we didn't start charging a, a PCIA to our customers. We paid it ourselves up until June of 2011. Okay, so every customer since June 2011 who has been here at least since June 2011 will get a check of some sort. Yes, in fact, there are other fees that are being changed as well. The uh, what's going the ongoing cost uh, transition, competition transition cost. Uh, that charge is being reduced by a little bit, and that's going to affect customers beyond just our rate base. Uh, but in particular, the customers that have been with us, they're going to be getting refunded uh, almost all of the PCIA they paid in 2011, and more than half of the PCIA they paid in 2012. To the extent that uh, <coughs> MCE paid for customers uh, for the PCIA, are we going to get that money back in, in our own coffers? Uh, the decision from the CPUC was uh, only retroactive to 2000 or June 2011, but I think Dawn might have more to add. Yeah, I just, just want to clarify that um, the, the PCIA will be covered and will be applied. The, if a customer paid a PCIA under the old formula and they were paying the PCIA any time after April of 2011, they will receive a rebate in full. Um, the fact that our rates might have been low enough to absorb that PCAA doesn't have an impact on the amount of rebate that a customer would receive. Um, the PCIA has always been a PG&E charge, and therefore the rebate will fully, um, you know, would be coming from PG&E in full. Um, I think the other thing that's important to note is that we do have information on our website, on the on the main homepage about this. We have a. a a question that pops up, you know, did you receive a check from PG&E? And then we have an explanation of what that means, why, they, why they're getting a check, um, a link they can follow to find out more, where we have a, a very long explanation of, of what, it, what it is. Um, and, and the reason that the checks were issued, just to back up even further, is that there was a concern that if the PCIA credit was applied to the customer's bill, it would have an impact on their MCE charges and would cause a lot of uh, billing errors and concerns and confusion and the only way that PG&E could um, find a solution that would not have an impact on the MCE charges and on the bill was to just issue checks separately. We, we were a bit concerned about that and what might happen with checks that don't get cash, what might happen with checks um, that don't get claimed or go to the wrong address, does it go back to PG&E, you know, what exactly happens. And, um, so we can spend more time talking about if there, that if there are questions, but there is, um, there is a website that uh, customers are encouraged to go to if they don't get their check. Um, and ultimately, any leftover revenue that doesn't get claimed or checks that don't get cashed is ultimately um, handed over to the state. My question went, went into the MCE portion to the extent that we ate some of that, we'll call it, uptick on the, on the, uh, on the uh, PCIA, did we get that back, we MCE? No, that goes back to the customer. But if we paid it for them prior to that time, would we get back that which we paid for them as an excess of what it should have been? Yeah, we didn't so pay the, the PCIA fee for the customer. We had rates set low enough to account for the difference so that the customer was, um, was not paying extra. Um, but we weren't paying the PCIA for them. We weren't issuing funds to PG&E, per se. Does that make sense? I hear you, but, but to the extent that our rates are less, uh, somewhere that squeeze went. Somewhere, someone got the benefit of that and didn't come back. That's, that is true. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Paul Soko at this point. He's going to speak for the Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Sogo. I'm the CCA Billing Manager at uh, Noble America's Energy Solutions. Um, our office is in San Diego, uh, downtown San Diego, 401 West A Street. 
Um, we've been active in the, uh, the energy industry in, in California as an electric service provider since 1998. Um, we're also in 16 other states, uh, deregulated markets, um, where we serve mainly uh, retail electricity to commercial and industrial um, customers. Um, we, we, we did, um, going back probably about six, seven years ago, start with the uh, uh, CCA um, implementation, um, help out with that on the regulatory side as well as the operational side. Um, and, uh, and now we're kind of moving towards the, what we call the mass market um, uh, building. Um, at Noble, um, with our, uh, in the 16 states that we have, we have uh, over 60 different utilities. Uh, we have over 50, uh, several 50,000 meters um, with these 60 utilities. And we build in excess of uh, two and a quarter billion dollars um, in revenue a year. Um, um, so, um, we're, you know, we, other than the electricity or the gas that we provide, um, we're mainly a customer service oriented um, business. We have, you know, we, we bill all of our customers and uh, we make sure that we provide them with the highest quality of service possible. Um, to that end, we are uh, uh, 9001, 2008 certified with the ISO, uh, which is the International Standards Organization. Um, where we consistently try uh, to meet um, our customer requirements and improve uh, our process efficiencies. Um, in doing that, we hire a third party company to go in and uh, do internal audits on our processes and, um, and on our quality controls. Uh, for MCE, um, we had a uh, we have two teams that are currently serving them. We had an implementation team that uh, started way back in uh, 2009, early 2010. Um, that consisted of, uh, at the time, a manager, two application administrators, one of the application administrators in charge of our billing uh, application and the other of our, our reporting. Um, we also have two EDI specialists that communicate consistently with PG&E. Um, the, the main form of communication between Noble and the Utility is uh, through EDI, which is uh, electronic data interchange. It's a common um, language that systems can uh, then communicate and uh, trade information. We also have two business analysts, one for each of the applications um, that serve our operational teams um, to help them out with the applications um, um, and uh, all some technical um, processing. Uh, we also have the operational team that currently uh, has two managers, um, which one I report to. Um, a little background, I've uh, been in this mission for all of two months. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I was on the implementation team beforehand um, as one of the application administrators. So I'm fairly familiar with the, with the program and, and, and the, the process, the billing process, and the billing software that we use for, uh, for the uh, MCE program. We also have two billing uh, representatives um, who are also our full center leads in San Diego. Um, we have a business analyst that communicates with um, PG&E um, on the, the account information that they send over the ADI and usage information. And then we also have our phone center uh, representatives. Um, currently we have uh, two offices, uh, one in San Rosa and one in Fair Oaks, uh, where we receive uh, calls from seven to seven um, 7 morning, 7 p.m. for general information uh, about the program, um, about MCE, um, about PG&E even, because the, the, one of the, the numbers that the customer receives on their third party portion of the bill is the, is the MCE call center number, and so you know, we'll get questions about both MCE and PG&E on that, on that side. Um, we also obviously get billing inquiries, um, people um, asking about this new third party detail, um, whether it's a high bill, a low bill. Um, fortunately, a lot of the, the questions that we do get can only be answered by PG&E as far as their metering concerns, um, things of that nature. So we do have to refer uh, them to PG&E uh, often. Um, we still get questions about deep green, 
which is great. Um, the customers do have the opportunity to enroll in Deep Green via the website or through the phone center, um, and that gets uh, input into our system, and then um, we're going to record it. Do you have questions about net energy metering, um, which is uh, you know, a big um, program that a lot of people are trying to get into, um, and it was getting big in San Diego as well. And lastly, and uh, not, the not so fun part is uh, the opt outs. Um, people that uh, you know, are getting the notices um, that they're actually sending, um, or they're seeing uh, a new third party uh, generation charge on their PG and bill, um, and then they're going to opt out. Um, there are times where we can uh, quote unquote talk them off the ledge and let them know that this is not you know, uh, either a new charge or an additional charge. Um, but it is a generation um, uh, charge, much like they would get uh, with uh, pg and &E. um, In San Diego, we have our two uh, phone center leads, uh, which are used for escalations. If our call center folks in Santa Rosa and Fair Oaks can't answer any of the questions that are posed, um, they do transfer them over to our San Diego office, and um, where we have uh, two highly qualified um, and knowledgeable uh, staff members who were able to um, answer most of the questions uh, that the customers have. Um, the third uh, and kind of crucial, more crucial uh, aspect of the relationship is uh, PGD. Um, Noble works with PGD on a daily basis. Um, we exchange a heck of a lot of information. As you guys know, there's uh, 93,000 um, customers. Uh, in, in the Marine Territory uh, currently being served. Um, this was a, there was a, a phased in approach, the most recent phase uh, starting in July, where customers, even before July, were able to opt uh, up to the program or opt out of the program. Um, the, what, what Noble received from PG&E uh, was an elig eligibility list. Um, people were taken were taken off of that based on whether or not they wanted to opt out before their their uh, July meter week started. Um, Noble then sends that list over to PG&E, um, and PG&E did a mass enrollment for all those customers, and they uh, they sent all of the EDIs um, and, and enrollment transactions to Noble, um, which housed all the account information, name, address, their meter, their rate schedule. Uh, whether or not uh, they have a medical baseline um, or they're part of the, the care program. Uh, pg &E also sends us usage information via EDI, uh, typically on a monthly basis, uh, where a meter gets read, let's say on the second, and three business days later, um, pg &E sends that EDI or that usage information over to Noble, and Noble will then um, <coughs> translate that data fix it, however, uh, you know, if, if there's something wrong with it, um, oftentimes there are, um, and then we'll send out that billing information over back to pg and &E, um, and then pg and &E will send, will then translate that and put that on uh, the customer's pg and &E bill um, <coughs> for generation. So, slide. Okay. Sorry, did I miss something? Right. Right. Um, Additionally, PG&E uh, sends us um, some information that's not always included on the uh, on the EDIs, where they send us a snapshot of all of the customers that are currently behind uh, MCE. Um, and we use that information to uh, further populate uh, information about, about the customers. Um, they're also sending us uh, what we're calling a pending start stop. Um, there is a more technical term for it, things like 4013 report, which really means a whole lot to, to everyone here. But the pending start stop just shows the customers that are about to start with Ruin and also uh, about to um, stop whether they moved out. Uh, before they opted out. So, with all the moving pieces, um, Noble sends daily uh, as well as weekly and monthly reports to, um, to MCE. 
On a daily basis, we do send a deep green opt-out, and I apologize, we don't have the sample report set up. Um, but the deep green opt-up report shows the customers that have either gone to that have either gone, uh, gone to the website to opt up to the deep green program or have called into the call center um, and, and to opt out. Um, we also have an opt out report um, that shows the customers that have either gone to the website or called uh, the call center to opt out of the program. On a weekly and or monthly basis, um, we in turn have a, a similar snapshot um, that kind of similar to what pg &E has that pretty much takes a um, direct picture of the customers in Noble's billing system um, that are MCE, and uh, we provide that information to MCE, uh, which houses also uh, customer um, name, address, uh, when they started with, uh, with MCE, when they ended with MCE, so it also includes you know, active and final um, accounts. On a weekly, monthly basis, we send an invoice summary, which shows all the invoices um, that were generated that week and or that month, um, as well as uh, the cash receipts that were received. Um, a days to invoice report that shows how, how long it takes from when the usage was received in-house from PG&E uh, to when we sent it back to PG&E for them to bill. Uh, we obviously shoot for a same day turnaround. Um, however, there are times when the PG&E data um, needs a little bit of uh, manipulation, um, or we have to go back to PG&E and tell them that, hey, there's, there's something wrong, uh, we need you to fix it um, before, before we can bill. Um, and an aging uh, that shows uh, current, um, current building as well as uh, um, some collections that are in, you know, 30, 60 years, standard uh, aging uh, before 30, 60, 120. Um, additionally, we have uh, some usage reports. Um, usage, again, is uh, you know, the, the, the product and, uh, that, um, that's provided. So we need to have the usage reports that show whether or not it's complete, accurate, um, so we're not, one, not billing the customer, and two, overbilling the customer um, for, uh, for their uh, consumption. Furthermore, on the operational side, we have um, Noble is in charge of user data reporting for MCE. Uh, we report <coughs> settlement data to the California ISO. Um, they require, uh, the California ISO requires us to uh, submit data uh, eight business days, uh, the first submission being eight business days past the usage uh, day. Um, with the data coming from PGE on a monthly basis, so uh, uh, excuse me, the data coming from PGE on a monthly basis, the eight business day submission is usually almost 100% uh, estimate. Um, I want to say if you know uh, if your usage time is from July 5 to August 5th, and you have to submit uh, meter data, you know, it's July 14th or 15th. Um, we're not going to have that data yet, and so we rely on uh, estimates based on your rate schedule, um, based on actual usage that was received or historical usage, um, to, the, to, to, to properly estimate for um, that day and for a specific hour of that day. Uh, by trade date plus 48 business days, we should have all the information from PG&E, which we can then uh, send back to California ISO and send uh, actual uh, meter data for settlement purposes. Um, and lastly, uh, we, with the call center that we have, we utilize a, a, or we try to get as much information as possible um, to do our call center metrics, um, call volume, uh, which I have the graphic. But it's it's been it's been fairly light. I mean, the the largest day that we had in August was 152 calls in one day. Um, and that was, after, that was a week where there were 40,000 uh, notices that were sent out. There were also 14,000 first invoices that went out to customers. And for, for, for that much communication going out, um, 152 calls was, was, was a cakewalk. So um, with those 152 calls, we, you know, or calls in a day, uh, we look at answer time, how long it takes from, from the customer goes for 
to, from the IVR uh, to an actual person. Um, and that's uh, been around 14, 15 seconds, so they're not on hold very long. Uh, the average talk time has been a little on the high side, about six minutes. Um, I think you know people have a lot of questions about the program and, and our, our call center folks um, are trying to help them out as, as much as possible um, on a, you know, and, and trying to resolve their issue in one call as opposed to maybe calling PG&E or escalating it to our San Diego office. Um, we'd like to get that down to about four minutes of call. Um, you know, it's frustrating uh, when, when, when you're on a call and it's just, you know, you're being passed around and it goes on and on and on. Um, and in Santa Rosa and Fair Oaks, we have um, three, we have uh, two dedicated agents in Santa Rosa and two dedicated agents in Fair Oaks, as well as um, some shared agents um, to handle all our calls. Any questions? Yes. So it's working well. It's working well. Uh, the question is, what is working oh. particularly well that you you like about the relationship with my Energy Authority, and conversely, what could be improved? Well, we, we have a, a great relationship. I think the communication that we have um, from between both entities, uh, I mean, calls, emails on a daily basis. Um, I think uh, everyone is um, getting more knowledgeable about the energy industry, about about CCA in general. Um, and uh, the, the constant collaboration uh, has been pretty good. And, and you know, we're, we're obviously, um, you know, we're, we're as you doing a service for MCE, um, but we also feel like we're partnered with them and, and serving the uh, Marin community. So the alternative question, and I'll add one more since I can't help myself today. The alternative question is, well, what could be improved? And are there any other CCAs anywhere in the country that Noble Energy Solutions is working with? Um, we're currently not working with any other CCAs at the moment. Uh, we are in talks um, with San Francisco. Um, there, there, several years ago, there were talks with, uh, with Kings River at the time. Um, but currently, uh, we have uh, our sales staff um, is not working anywhere outside of California for CCA. Um, and to answer your question, um, to the improvement uh, with the relationship, I, I honestly, being so new, uh, you know, at this position, um, that there hasn't really been anything that I can com complain about as far as the relationship with with Marin. Um, again, you know, well, not necessarily talk about the relationship. Also, what you know, now that I understand you've only been in a couple of months. Is there something you see that could be improved upon so that the transfer of information is more efficient, or more things that we can be doing? And I'll, of course, ask the same of our staff what they would expect from Noble Energy Solutions as well. I'm just and these are kind of general questions, but if anything sticks out at you. Right. No, um, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't really speak on the program itself. I mean, that's, that's a important thing. You know, the back office services that we, that we provide um, has been, uh, you know, uh, has been good. And the, and the information that we're receiving from them and the constant collaboration and the questions that we receive from them are expected. Um, but as far as, uh, as far as the program itself, I mean, I, I, I couldn't. Comment on that. Well, I wasn't really asking you to comment upon, you know, whether the CC is good or. or uh, well, I was more interested in, in because what your business does is critical to the success of what my energy authority and our program MCE is doing. I mean, you're you're a right arm out there talking to the customers and helping with the billing and all that. We it's an important relationship. Right. So so I'm just asking, just in general, if you see. Not if CCA is a good idea or what or what we're doing, but just in terms of there is there something better that we can be doing as well in terms of providing information or collaborating with. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the information that we get obviously is is good. Um, one of the uh, important uh, a lot of the complaints that we get are from customers who just aren't as um, aware of the program uh, as other people, and I think um, you know communication, community outreach, which you guys are doing. Um, uh, and you know the, the grassroots kind of type of marketing that's, that's going on um, is definitely helping. I think a lot of the frustration comes from a lack of knowledge um, and, and information that the, that the public has. And if that was improved, um, and which I, you know we meet twice a month, um, and there's constant talks about you know, uh, farmers markets and um, you know 
board meetings, uh, HOA meetings, and, and whatnot. I think uh, I, I think all that's important. And, and if that continues to uh, um, to happen, I think uh, we'll, we'll, you know, the public will be more informed, and um, there'll be less complaints. There'll be less um, hesitation um, to join the program, um, and also, you know, and, and more retention with that, with that actual knowledge. And I, I think another area where, it, and it's not something that Noble's doing, but um, that we we like to see improved is just uh, access to more timely meter data. Uh, now that uh, pg and has put smart meters on the majority of customers, we're really not taking full advantage of pg and &E's not providing that data next day at all. Um, and so that's sort of a, a, at this point, uh, we don't feel we're getting full kind of utility out of those, out of that technology, out of those meters. So that's something that you know, we would like to see as, as we, um, as we continue down the, down the line here, uh, getting more timely data. That helps it to NBA in a lot of areas, namely in its load forecasting, so that we can be a lot more tighter on the, on the daily load forecast uh, that we have to interface with the, with the CAISO. So that's more of a regulatory process because it really involves PG&E. Um, but you know, hopefully over time that will improve and, and we won't have to rely on data that you know, we don't see for 30 or 60 days uh, as, as we try and operate the, the business. Yeah, I'd like to, to clarify too. I mean, that particular issue, um, really the one thing that's kind of been holding us back is, is PG&E's interpretation of existing regulatory environment around that data is that uh, they don't um, know whether or not they can or to what capacity they should be sharing that data. And so we've gotten a lot of pushback directly from PG&E specifically that they're waiting for the, how the regulatory process plays out and will uh, work with us once that is concluded. Um, but it, I think it does kind of go back into what a big part of Noble's role is and how we all fit together is that uh, there are definitely challenges with integrating PG&E systems, uh, particularly as a lot of PG&E systems are antiquated or are um, not easily changeable that we do encounter issues with certain aspects of customer data or account data, things like that. And we all have to work collaboratively to find a solution uh, that overcomes those challenges. And that we spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, and it, it's a difficult process, but it's one of those things that when you do fix something, uh, you fix it for all the time down the line too. And then you don't have to, to really worry about that at all anymore. So that, that's a big part of, of the role Noble plays, um, in particular Sam Schmidt, who unfortunately is, isn't here today, but he uh, has been pretty instrumental in coming up with a lot of uh, clever solutions for, for working around uh, difficulties with pg and &E data. Just on, on the meter um, issue, um, it's interesting there's a 30 to 60 day lag on the information exchange because I'm sure pg e is using the information, you know, on an ongoing basis to the extent they can. We are in a very similar position as they are as far as using aggregate information. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is whether, uh, you know, Fairfax County and Marin are involved in an opt-out proceeding on smart meters and whether um, our agency has authority under the enabling statutes to um, either install our own meters or take over meter reading function um, for PG&E. In other words, do we have that authority under you know the foundational statutes from the state to do to, to pick up that function at some point? Right. Yeah. Just. It, we are not allowed under legislation to, to do that. So our only function really is to provide the procurement. And so it's it's clear in the, in the statute that that is um, really a matter for PG&E. They're, they're metering and billing. We can't opt to do our own billing, for example. So that's all required to be done by PG&E. And so, um, you know, our our agency really doesn't have any say in that. That's but there's you know regulatory proceedings that have been going on for a while now um, on those on those matters. Why why couldn't you do your own billing if you wanted to? It's just part of the statute. 
Um, yeah, we need a statutory change um, to legislation to change that. Yeah, and the other part of my question is, are they, where, where are the meters, are, are they actually um, obtaining time of use information now? Where, where the system is up and running? And, I mean, I'm not aware whether the system is operational. Yeah, we've been told that they are receiving the data. Um, they are receiving residential data in hourly intervals. They receive commercial data from those commercial classes in more frequent intervals. Um, but they do not yet use that data for settlement purposes, so they don't rely on that data for their billing um, of, of customers. They will probably begin to do that in the, in the next couple of years. So that's something that the, the regulatory body is really intended with the uh, smart meter rollout. But they are not yet using that data for settlement. And right now, we're getting our, our rates flattened. I thought when PG&E &E actually flattened rates when we did our rollout. Well, our rates are flat, but the tier effect now shows up on the non-generation side of the bill, which is PG&E's portion. On the distribution side. Correct. Mm -hmm. Not exactly on the di well, no. to, to be <laughs> To be technical about it, it's actually a non-bypassable charge non um, that's laid on top of the, the flat generation charge. So the conservation incentive adjustment, if you're a low usage customer, um, you receive a negative, you know, negative bill credit, and then if you are above a certain usage point, it's a positive bill charge. And the way that the conservation incentive adjustment is, is calculated is it's net neutral to PG&E, so they have, they have no financial incentive one way or another for that specific charge. It evens out in the end. Um, but then that's what creates this stepped up in tiering effect. And right now, the tiers are based on your total amount of energy use, but not time of use, correct? Correct. Um, and so if you, um, essentially, if you add together all of the rate components, the like generation and transmission distribution and, and this not by possible charge, you, you end up at the exact same spot as you would otherwise. It's just broken into additional components. Right, I'm, I'm just wondering as far as the tiers, the tiers are based on the gross amount of electrical power yes. that you consume. It's not based on time of use like you're using during peak time. And we, that has not been. Right. Well, that, that said, what's important to note is that time of use customers do still uh, receive uh, conservation incentive adjustment. They are still charged for tiers, but it's allocated between the time of use periods based on of what percentage of their electricity is during each of those time and use periods. And are those, are those customers residential or commercial? Only residential customers pay a conservation incentive adjustment. Commercial customers do not have any tiering effect at all. Is it all consumers, residential? All residential, yes. So there is a tiering So, I mean, is, is, is there a time of use incentive that's in place now? Uh, there is. Or, or disincentive? Well, residential customers pay time of use rates um, if, if they're on time of use schedule. So Res1 customers don't have any time of use charges. They charge the same cost for electricity, and then there's a tier adjustment for that electricity. If they're a time of use customer, if they're Res6, Res7, uh, Res9, they have their time of use generation rates. And then on top of the time of use generation rates, there is that conservation incentive adjustment, which is the tiering effect. So to get deep into an example, uh, if you had a, a Res 6 customer and 75% of their usage is during uh, uh, off-peak and 25% of the usage is during peak, um, they're still going to have a conservation incentive adjustment on each of those blocks. And, and that would be MEA customers included in that? Yes, you, uh, MEA customers have a conservation incentive adjustment on the non-generation side of their bill. PG&E customers also have a conservation incentive adjustment with, contained within their bundled rates. That's all MEA residential? Users. That's correct. How do you, does that show up on the bill? Uh, it shows up as a conservation incentive adjustment line item on the non-generation side of the bill and PG&E side of the bill. Uh, if they use only a little bit of electricity, they're going to see a big credit. They might see like a $20 uh, 
uh, minus $20 conservation incentive adjustment. But if they use a lot of electricity, they might see a you know, $160 conservation incentive adjustment charge. It really depends on how much electricity they use. But the overall impact of it is designed to function the same way that the tier system functioned prior to July 1st. I think it's noteworthy that the significant majority, though, of, of MEA's residential customers are not affected by the time of use rates. Their, right, their tiering effect is going to be entirely related to the amount of energy that they use. So this is a very month and on a monthly basis. On a monthly yeah, basis. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And so the other, the, the time of use folks are folks that have deliberately opted in to this specific program. Yes, yeah, uh, pe people who are on time of use rates, you have to choose to be on a time of use rate. Uh, so customers call and, and they say, tell PG&E actually we can't change the rates. Uh, P they have to change them with PG&E. Uh, and then we get that information and we change the rate schedule appropriately. But they sign up for a time of use rate schedule. Okay. Thanks a lot. This is sort of tangential on what he was asking. Uh, does PG&E have a, um, a, count, uh, a schedule as to when the consumers are going to have access to their smart meter rate information? Yeah. No. Yes, <laughs> sorry, that's another regulatory proceeding, but yes. Um, they, they should have access to that shortly if it's not already up and running. That There's um, there's a proceeding going on that's, that's wrapping up um, that it allows for this, what they're calling this green button approach, what they call it a data backhaul. Um, but I would assume that would be no later than early next year, if not sooner. And we'll get some thing in writing from PG telling us how to do it? I would assume so. I, you know, I haven't been involved on that particular proceeding um, since it's more of Issue that doesn't impact their yeah, I mean, my house, for instance, you know, I live up in Sacramento area, but it's PG&E, and they put the smart meter in a couple of years ago. And it took a few months, got a letter um, about how to log into their website, and you can actually see you know, usage from yesterday, and then you know prior to that, obviously. Um, so you know, depending on the rollout schedule, the customer itself will have access um, if you don't already. The what's um, still an issue is is essentially third-party access to, to that data. Um, in our case, you know, MEA needs access to that data because it's the service provider. That's what's not yet resolved. There is one other issue with that as well. It's worth noting that uh, pg e does not uh, provide the information on the online access of uh, third-party generation charges. And so um, when customers do look at the online data, they're only going to be getting non-generation charges provided. They don't have a detail on how much Green Clean Energy is charging that customer for their usage for the current month. Uh, that's something that we've had some concern about. We've, we've definitely had other higher priority things, but it is something we would so want to So it's just going to indicate the amount of energy, but not the cost of it. That's correct, yeah. Uh, John, uh, this was a topic uh, uh, at our last board meeting. Are you able to interpret the data? And, and you obviously you are very involved with energy production and you, and you know the terminology. So I guess a more appropriate question would be, can the average customer interpret the data that they're getting to really accomplish the goal that PG&E says they're supposed to accomplish? Right, so you're, you're, I think you're asking just about your own usage data with right. smart meters? You know, um, there's there's some useful information. I mean, I, I, what you see is essentially over the course of a 24-hour period, you know, how much energy you are using. So you can sort of make some some inferences about okay, what might be happening there. Um, personally, you know, I, I can interpret it, but I I don't find it all that earth-shattering in terms of information. I think really where the, the value of these meters is going is when pricing and rates are tied to the to the uh, time of use, uh, you know, uh, usage. So, I think that's really the whole purpose of, of the utilities putting in the smart meters is to move to more demand response, move to where you know customers are actually making decisions um, about changing their consumption patterns based on the prices that are changing 
you know, on, a, on a, either a time of use basis or maybe even an hourly basis. So tell that time. And then the other thing about it is I think the idea is over time technology, automation technology will start being built into your house, your appliances. Um, and so you have more of an automated sort of demand response. So I mean, that's that's my own personal opinion. The information in and of itself is, you know, kind of neat. But once you've looked at your load curve a couple of times, there's not much point to going back and, and doing yeah. it again. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm sorry. Eventually, there are going to be smart smart appliances and smart <laughs> um, electric strips and stuff, so that you can actually identify what appliance in your home is using what electricity, right? But that's not real. They're going to manufacture you have to start building that into the refrigerators. Right. Yes, some of that stuff it already exists in the California independent system operator has a really neat lab, I think they call it, that you know features what a smart home would look like. Um, and they can show the interrelationships between price signals from a rate perspective and customer energy use and how appliances are managed within the home to really drive down costs and, and, and create less stress on the system. That's well. really what the big picture is. That's the big picture, yeah. So, you know, while I think a, in a lab setting that exists, it's just a, a ways off until that's all integrated. Right now it's just kind of satisfying a curiosity that somebody might have as to how they're using energy. but. You know, until that price signal is imposed on the customer, where they can look and see, hey, wow, my pool pump cycling on at a time of day where it's very expensive. I'm going to go reprogram that, or whether it's another appliance, an air conditioner, or something else. Then, then it's you know, it's a little less uh, personally impactful. Uh, yeah, there, you know, there is a data point on this. Um, about two years ago, the city of Boulder, Colorado, spent a ton of money to implement a true smart grid all over town with everybody has, has a, a machine in their home that reads out their usage on a, you know, they can get it off online and so forth and so on. And at the time, they were convinced that if we give people all this data, something will happen. And absolutely nothing happened, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and they, 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 the conclusion came out that what they needed was a great deal more marketing thinking in terms of how do we make this data something that, that consumers care about, that consumers get involved in. And this was, you know, a, a population that makes Marin look like the slums in terms of their, their intellectual and liberal political involvement in all this. But deep down inside, nobody really cared about looking at their electricity usage as just a naked fact, as just data. So they, they said, they got to the conclusion that says, we need a layer of marketing on this. We need something that turns this turns this data into something that people will actually respond to. But then they they got totally diverted by converting Boulder to public power. So I don't know where it stands now. Yeah. Well, they you know just they they've got, had it in Quebec for a while, and you know the bottom line has been an increase in electrical rates, and and without really you know a corresponding decrease in electrical usage. So you know. Uh, at the end of the day, it's you know of marginal benefit to the consumer. So we'll, you know, I think the jury's still out, really. My daughter lived in Boulder for five years, and that community is very uh, aware. And, if, and in my opinion, is if they on a, on a lot of things, if they didn't find any interest or use in it, that's sort of depressing. Just in, I mean, in case people are interested, um, there is another way to find out what your appliances um, actually use. You, there's something called a kilowatt, other things, date, they're called data loggers, and you can put the, you know, put that in the plug, in between the plug and the, and the appliance, and you can see what your toaster uses, or your refrigerator, or your, your air conditioner, and uh, so you can find out um, this kind of information without the smart meter. And uh, you know, I I always thought that would be kind of interesting to know, and certainly would be helpful if you had some old appliances that were using a tremendous amount of electricity. Um, but uh, I think it's really interesting if 
folder isn't seeing any difference from from that information. I, I've always kind of wondered about you know how much that would change things because in fact people don't have as much you know flexibility. You know, I mean you're not going to get up at one o'clock in the morning and do your laundry just because it's cheaper then. I, I mean it's just not going to happen. Yeah, and, and you know Barbara. Uh, brings up a really important point. I mean, what we're talking about here is, you know, behavioral change, and that's very hard. And, and, and I think the way you're going to achieve change is through price signals. Um, you know, data as a means to affect change is probably not that effective. Um, but the rates, uh, on the other hand, will, will likely get people's atten attention. And so I think the collection of data will likely inform the rate setting process and the rate setting process in turn will affect people's behavior and that's where you're likely to see change. But you know, the other place I think the industry certainly expects it is basically the evolution of technology. In other words, you're not going to get up at two in the morning to dry your clothes when the energy is cheaper. But if the next dryer you bought had a button on there that says dry the clothes at two in the morning, you'd do it. And that's the kind of thing the, the industry is heading toward. It's a little bit like cars. You could have gotten much better mileage from your car 10, 15 years ago by changing your driving habits, and nobody did, but then they started making something like the Prius, and people started to buy. Well, in the interim, though, the thing is, again, to point out the statistics of our customer base, 4% of our residential customers are on, are, are on time of use rates. Actually, it's not even 4% because uh, Res 8 is not a time of use rate schedule. So. Uh, it, less than 4% of our customers are on time of use rates. So when you're telling them, you know, what their peak usage is versus their off peak, it doesn't really matter because they're charged the same price for that electricity. If you saw a shift of customers on time of use rate schedules, then it might be more important, important to have that kind of data accessible. Uh, all that said, you know, when you look uh, particularly at PG&E's numbers for these kinds of schedules, the revenues they pull in on time of use rate schedules and things like that, despite lower distribution costs attributed to them, because of how people use electricity, if they're not using a time of use rate schedule in a way that's, that's conducive to billing, it can end up costing them more money or the same amount of money than it costs them to be on a flat rate schedule. Any further uh, questions or comments on this item? Anything else for Noble? Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, let's get started. So, I'm going to talk about the uh, integrated resource plan, and this is really, I think, a fairly big step, a nice development for the agency uh, in establishing this, this document, uh, which in the past, uh, MBA has, has dealt with its resource planning uh, through its implementation plan primarily. The implementation plan laid out certain, uh, certain plan procurements and policies. Uh, but what this document does is it really builds upon that and updates the uh, resource plan that has, has been previously contained in that implementation plan. So I think it, it's, it's, it's going to be very useful to have both internally um, as well as externally when the MBA deals with uh, potential power sellers or regulators or financial institutions. It's a nice document that encapsulates um, a lot of what MBA is doing and, and how it's managing this very important part of its business, which is the, the resource management uh, part. So the idea here is that this document would be updated on an annual basis and then brought to the board uh, for approval annually. And it really has three primary purposes. And um, the first is, is more of a quantitative exercise to look over a, a fairly long period of time in the future, a 10 year planning horizon, and uh, quantify the, the uh, customer loads of the program and uh, different resource needs over that planning horizon. And another purpose is, is really policy oriented. It's, it's a way to sort of crystallize uh, policy of the agency on the procurement side, prior to prioritize resource preferences, um, and establish other procurement related policies. And then the third sort of related purpose is to provide guidance then uh, to, to program management uh, as, as it engages in, in the procurement process throughout the year. 
go to, uh, here we are. So it, just starting off in, in putting the plan together, uh, we tried to capture really the, the key sort of policies that MEA has established to date in regards to its, uh, its resource planning and management. And they're listed here on, uh, on this slide. Uh, the first being to MEA is, is sort of missioned with reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and other things <coughs> through, through increased use of renewable resources and commercially by decreasing reliance on fossil fuel resources. I think that's a, one of the core policies that this agency has established and operated to. Uh, second, uh, and, and these aren't necessarily in, in order, but the uh, second key policy is to, is to maintain competitive electric rates um, and not only competitive rates, but also a, a greater degree of control over energy costs, uh, primarily through management of the diverse resource mix that really reflects the, the, sort of the goals and values of the community as opposed to you know, what decisions that might be made by the, the large utility or, or even potentially the state of California. Um, the third policy is, is to provide some tangible benefits to the local area economy. Um, through investments in local infrastructure, primarily generation related, uh, and other energy programs such as energy efficiency or um, other distributed generation type programs. Um, that sort of ties into the next one, which is helping customers to reduce their energy consumption and their costs. Uh, and that's primarily through demand side programs such as the energy efficiency program, our net energy metering tariff. And then finally, to enhance system reliability through the investments in, in the supply and demand side resources. <coughs> so moving from sort of the key policies to, um, to uh, specific, a little bit more of the specifics of the, of the draft resource plan. The first point here is that MEA has established a 50% Sort of renewable energy content, and so the plan uh, extends that throughout the 10-year period, so that uh, during the next 10 years, that a minimum of 50% of the resources will come from renewable resources. Um, well, actually, the overall programmatically will be a little bit more than that because the 50% would be the content for the default service provision, the light green rate option, and then to the uh, participation in the voluntary deep green, which is 100% renewable option, will, will add to that. Uh, and sort of uh, related to that as well is to maintain the carbon neutral energy content uh, at or above pg and &E. so that's, that's also in, in a, a, a goal that's uh, been expressed in conjunction with the overall renewable energy content. And the difference there, of course, is that uh, there are some non-renewable resources or, or resources that don't qualify as, as being renewables by the state standards, for instance, hydroelectric, um, that, are, that don't emit uh, carbon, that have no greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and PGE happens to have you know, a fair amount of that type of resource in its portfolio. So MEA has also established a policy to um, maintain its overall GHG content at or below um, PGE, and, and that's that would be extended throughout this planning period. In regards to uh, local renewable resources, the plan is set out through a combination of, of behind the meter, net energy metering, and standalone uh, projects, which would be under our, our feed-in tariff program, projects similar to the, the San Rafael Airport program. Um, we've established a target of 30 megawatts, so that's 20 megawatts under Net energy metering and 10 megawatts of standalone through the Vita tariff of local and county, or uh, with the expansion of Richmond within jurisdiction, um, renewable resources. That's a fairly significant increase uh, from for the net energy metering. We're talking about a 250 percent increase from where we are today, um, and for the Vita tariff today, we'll we'll be at you know, with the first project just under a megawatt. So the plans over the next 10 years to be to, to move that up to 10 megawatts. So fairly aggressive there. And then on the demand side, um, 
the, uh, the plans for energy efficiency programs to meet about 2% of annual energy sales. So that should be sufficient to displace any natural uh, growth in energy that we would see over the, over the planning period. And uh, in demand side, demand response resources, which we, we don't yet, MEA doesn't yet operate any demand response programs, but um, probably will in the, over the, the planning period here. So we've established a target of meeting about 5% of MEA's total capacity needs through demand response. We go to the next, this is a, an illustration of uh, the types of resources that we would expect to, um, to meet MEA's requirements during this period. Uh, you can see that uh, at the bottom, you know, we expect a, a fairly heavy and increasing reliance on solar, and, and that's largely reflective of what we're seeing in the marketplace in regards to the, the cost of solar just coming down significantly in the last few years and also really an abundance of opportunities uh, for MBA to contract with, with solar projects. Uh, these tend to be, compared to other types of generation projects, relatively easy to permit, site, um, and construct. So we expect over time increasingly to be uh, using more and more solar. Other major technologies we'd expect to see during this time would be wind um, and also Biomass or biogas. Today, it's primarily been biogas, so these would be the, the, the landfill gas projects in the edge, a couple of contracts today with landfill gas projects. Uh, we also get some energy through biomass uh, uh, projects as well. And then you can see the effect of the energy efficiency and the behind the meter generation, or the, the NEM, net energy metering up at the top there, uh, really uh, taking reducing MEA's load over time and reducing the need to, to buy system energy or fossil energy. We've got a little bit of, um, of large hydro coming in in 2015. That, that would be related to the agreement, the power purchase agreement with the U.S. Western Area Power Administration. Um, and then uh, we've got some projections of a little bit of small hydro in there um, throughout the term. So and these are, uh, not all of this is under contract. Uh, so, this is illustrative for the most part. System. The actual mix is going to depend on market conditions, opportunities, and whatnot when MBA goes and engages in additional procurement. Uh, this is a, a, a reasonably representative look at what the mix is probably. John, before you go on to the next slide, can I ask what, what happens to 2017 that you expect a decrease in solar? Why wouldn't that just increase? Right in a linear fashion. Right, so what's happening there is recently MEA executed a short-term solar contract um, with recurrent energy. This was a couple of months back, and so that project comes on, it is gonna be producing in 2016 and 17, and then it's, it's done. Then it, it's actually going to be selling to one of the large utilities. That's why you see that little bump up there. So you're projecting that the energy uh, acquisition is going to remain static after 2014 for the next seven years? The total? No, I don't think so. Um, why do you say that? You're capped out at 1,200 and you're not... Oh, the overall? Yeah. yeah. Overall of, okay, yeah, so um, yeah, that one is, I, I would call it a simplifying assumption. Basically, what we have is um, you know, we've got our customer base, and then you typically, if you look at the, let's say you look at the county, you're typically going to see a small increase, maybe one and a half percent a year uh, energy usage. So we also, since this is a voluntary program, we have a couple of things that are going to counteract the normal increase. One would be customers who decide for whatever reason to leave the program. So we have a, a, you know, a little bit of attrition might be something like 1% a year. Um, and then we have um, energy efficiency programs that can bring it down. So, uh, and then on the other side, we have potential expansion into other communities. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't try and fine tune too much the, the long-term load forecast, because we recognize that within this time frame, there's gonna be 
probably big developments that are going to you know have material changes in the total number of customers like if there was another expansion to another community that's going to be a, a massive change in the load forecast um, so to keep things simple we just basically said well customer attrition is probably going to be a going to about offset the normal rate of growth in customers and so we just and so there's really no factor in there for <clears throat> increase or reduction in each particular customer in the average customer's use for the well yeah. if, you, if you have the same number of customers right and you have the same amount of energy then and you don't I don't know if the efficiency stands for well but and you have this, it, it always at 1200 you're assuming that the customer each customer uses exactly the same amount of energy in 2014 as they do in 2021 there's no except for the well the energy efficiency would reduce the per capita consumption but that doesn't get bigger the, well i mean you pre the pre-energy efficiency yeah that's that's that is assumed to be essentially uh, essentially constant yes there's no conservation by individuals uh, there would be, in addition to what's, yeah, I mean, we're not assuming any additional conservation other than what's captured in the energy efficiency net energy metering slice there. So, I mean, we, we're, we're going to be rolling out programs to help customers reduce energy, right, energy consumption. So that's factored into it. Um, you know, what typically happens is actual growth in the per capita consumption. I mean, just look at historically what happens to people buy iPods and then, you know, everything's electronic, right? So. Typically, you see increases, but with uh, opportunity for additional energy efficiency programs, we think we can we can offset that. So we could we think that basically we're going to see a, a fairly flat type of the load growth over time. Yes. Um, just one thing about the the biggest chunk is the system energy, and you know I thought one of our goals was really to reduce reliance on system energy by either developing our own you know resources and developing solar and i'm just wondering uh, that looks pretty flat through you know the projected end of, of this um, snapshot i mean is is there anything else we can do and maybe this is a discussion point for this afternoon to reduce our reliance on system energy and go towards you know, local solar, you know, and our own distributed small projects that I know we're working on now. I mean, because this, it's pretty much the projection is we're going to be relying on system power to the same extent we are now at the end of the, uh, the term. Right. Right. And that's, um, you know, I think that's a, a fair point. Um, you know, I think the way we've been looking at it is compared to without MEA, and that system, you know, without MEA, that system power is, is you know, 80% uh, nearly of, of the total mix. And so, you know, we're moving to 50% right away now. Since we've moved to 50% so quickly, sort of ahead of schedule, uh, the question is, should that 50% increase over time so that the system energy you know, continues to get squeezed? You know, I think that's certainly a, a Fair, fair comment, uh, something worthy of, of discussion. There's potentially uh, a rate implication um, to that. You know what what we see in today's market is that um, we're procuring renewable energy. It it's, comes at a higher cost than non-renewable energy, just on a pure dollars basis. I and mean, the product considerations aside, um, so you know we have some. Competing goals, I would say, uh, that, that uh, the agency is trying to balance, and so this tension between uh, rates and having the lowest rate possible, and uh, you know, a renewable product, that's really the balance that needs to be struck. Um, so, you know, certainly one I think one could could argue that um, uh, the agency might want to tilt the balance a little bit more towards the renewables. But that would in all likelihood have uh, have a great consequence. So understood. So, understood. John, so I mean, would it be fair to say that this chart represents a conservative assessment of where we may go within really what is quite a long time period in a dynamic market? It's not an aspirational chart. 
it's more a conservative expectation of what might happen, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. And, and I think where the upside comes in would be in the deep green participation. I mean, we could push deep green participation to you know 25% of our customer base, then it starts to do what, what you want to do. It starts to squeeze out the system energy. This, these projections uh, have assumed about a 5% participation in deep green. Um, so I think, I think you're right. This is, um, I, would, I would say, uh, sort of a conservative, uh, maybe realistic projection. It's not, we're going to shoot the moon type of, a, you know, type of an analysis. Yeah. But any forecast like this is going to take into consideration policy decisions and policy and programs as to what, where you want to go. Well, sure, but I think that's that's why the chart is going to change over time because you know where's the market going to be in 2020? We don't know that. It's hard to make those projections at this. Well, point. but anything, any any chart, any forecast has certain mm -hmm. policy decisions. And this policy decision that's incorporated in this chart is, I think, I guess I'd say relatively conservative, conservative. in the fact that. We're assuming we're going to stay with the system energy. We're assuming that there isn't really going to be any major conservation. It's also assuming that there isn't going to be a significant or actually any growth in the in the membership of the, any net growth in the membership of MEA. Those are all conservative. Mm -hmm. So that those preconceptions are in here. So it. it no, I think that was my point. It's yeah. It was conservative rather than aspirational. I mean, we could create another chart that really showed our aspirations of what we'd like to have happen and then have a conversation about how realistic that is. And that's another way to approach the subject. I would hate three years down the road for the board or the staff to say, well, we're there, so we're doing the way what we predicted. Because, right, it, it isn't, I think, what we want, where we want to be. And so I would hate to rest on the laurels that we're accomplishing that. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. So this is what, if this is ultimately approved this year, this is what, what staff would be working towards in planning this year. Next year at this time, an update to this would be brought. Um, maybe the market's changed a little bit. Maybe policy has is, is changed a little bit. Maybe, you know, the, the overall target could, could change. So we're doing a 10-year planning period, but there's really only a year's worth of sort of activity that's going to happen until we update it again. Right, and I suppose the caveat to that, though, John, which gets back to your point, is that we're signing 20-year contracts, so that yeah. we really are sort of cementing this mm -hmm. notion in place by our long-term contracts. So obviously there's some flexibility there, too, because we do have short-term contracts as well. But I think it does raise a question, a fair question, of whether we want to have a slightly more aggressive vision of where we're going, and yeah. whether that's a realistic thing to do, John. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think I think that's absolutely the purpose of this this meeting. Um, is, is my reaction to that. So I think the what's the key policy issue here is you know, this hard goes in a 50% renewable content, uh, and so I think. Sounds like there should be some discussion about maybe pushing that, um, maybe understanding a little bit of what what you know. You can eat, like you said, you can either just set the policy sort of aspirational, um, and at least that moves you in, in the in the direction that you want to go. Um, I think what, like I said earlier, what we tried to do with this fifty percent, we think this is is uh, doable and with competitive rates. And if you said, hey, push it to 75% today, I would say, well, okay, that's probably going to have some rate impact that you're not going to like to see. Um, but, uh, at the same time, in the next year, we wouldn't go out and contract for 75% you know, of the wish limit. This is going to be a staggered process. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's really, uh, it's really uh, I, I feel well. And keeping in mind that 50% is actually pretty darn good. Yeah. I feel more, I feel comfortable if, along with the chart like this, we identify, and maybe we work it out now over the next period of time, what our goals are. And are our goals to reduce the system energy, our goal, are our goals to reduce the, the membership, are our goals to encourage conservation. And, and then from those goals, we can set forth policies and programs in order to reach our goals. I think that's really what this is about. 
And I think that that overall question is going to come up yeah. in a number of different ways as, as we go forward with the discussion. So let's definitely keep that in mind. Right. One, one thing thing well. to be mindful of too is that this particular this particular uh, chart here doesn't really capture the nature of the resource that's supplying the power. So I would think that to the extent that more and more of these renewable resources become locally situated, that's a good thing and that's not reflected here. So if that percentage, even if it, you know, for the near term we're looking out and we're saying, well, okay, we want to hit that 50% number and make sure we're there. If we're making progress on the localization front to move more and more of those resources in or near um, our, our service territory, I think that's a positive takeaway that maybe isn't reflected here, and, and maybe that needs to, you know, kind of be folded into the discussion as well. Can I just make one more brief point? I, I mean, I think that our agency needs to be a leader, not just in, you know, hobbling ourselves into a non-competitive mode with our energy sourcing, but also lobbying uh, the CPUC to move the, the entire state in that direction so that we're all on a level playing field because we need to get there and somebody needs to do the pushing and I don't think it's going to be PG&E or Southern California Edison that's going to be doing it. It's going to be you know, agencies like ours and other public agencies that are really responding to the needs of the community. So you know, I, I just would like to see us sort of stake out some of the positions uh, at the CPUC where we're lobbying for maybe a higher feed in tariff or other kind of rebates to build out our local solar. I just, as part of the discussion, I'd like to see what is the most realistic ways that we can increase the clean energy content, whether it's a, a, a an effective PACE program in this county or what, uh, but how, how that occurs is something that I think we, we should include as part of the discussion. Steve, did you have a question? Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you know, my concern when I look at this is it looks like the agency is working their tails off for the first few years and then goes into autopilot, you know, to finish it out. And um, it looks like the hard work on um, solar and biomass is sort of ne negated by the loss of wind energy, uh, if you just look at that. Um, and so you don't rise above. And, so one thought I would suggest that you might consider is creating a wedge uh, that identifies your goal so that you can see in the out years that you are continuing to reduce the system energy even if you haven't identified how. But you just say this is our target for innovation uh, and, and it allows that chart not to look as though you're so static after the, next, the first few years. I think that's a good Chair? Yeah, I agree with that. <coughs> yes. Is that all right? One of the things that uh, that was on this similar chart last year at the retreat was MEA's open position. And it gets to a little bit of what you were just saying, Steve. So I would just be curious, John, if you're able to comment on, because it looks like MEA is fully restored, resourced out through the through the end of next year. What What would you say is the open position? within that context over the next five years? Yes, yeah, so. Because that helps you then right. fill those different gaps. Mm -hmm. we, we focus on an open position for bundled renewable energy. Um, we're, uh, MEA is about 50% covered through the 10-year horizon. About 100% out the next five years and about 50% beyond. Uh, so it, it, we'll get into that actually in a couple of slides and we'll get more uh, information on that. Some of the, there's, there's also some shorter term, uh, like bucket three or renewable energy credit uh, procurement that MEA does that is, is, is just naturally done on a shorter term basis, so there's not so much coverage there. But for the uh, bundled renewables, things like in state uh, solar or what have you, uh, so the coverage rate is about 50% you know, on a little long term basis. Great. Yes? I have a couple of sure. questions. Um, and this might be the kind of thing that could go in into the wedge of not necessarily identified, but you know, aspirational resources. Uh, um, one would be geothermal, since we have a resource pretty close by here, and there are other uh, geothermal resources. Um, 
storage technologies is something that the commission is uh, starting to finally take seriously. Um, and uh, that's, you know, not in a way as much of our problem as it is on the distribution side, but it certainly helps to firm up renewable energy so that you can count more of it. Um, right now, you are not allowed to actually count the full resource because you've got to figure on backing up the intermittence. Um, and uh, I've seen some really interesting figures uh, recently on on gas. Uh, natural gas has, you know, has been at its lowest price ever, which was always seen as the worst thing that could happen to our program because of the renewable energy. You know, in relation to gas, is you know renewables looks more expensive. Um, but because gas has been so incredibly cheap, uh, what I'm seeing is that the um, drilling has fallen off drastically, and in fact, is um, uh, you know the production side of the natural gas industry is um, you know is way down, and what that. You know, I, what I'm seeing some people predicting is a pretty near-term spike in the price of gas. And this happened before when, you know, gas production was down. That was really, um, you know, the energy crisis of 2000, 2001 was driven by the price of gas, originally not the price of electricity. Uh, so we could be seeing a, um, you know, really different situation in, in that area. I'm curious you know, what the consultants um, think of that possibility. I also would like, as I said, I'd like to see geothermal. I'd like to see storage. I'd also like to see more hydro. Um, I have a particular fondness for San Joaquin Irrigation District. I don't know if any of that power is available. I know it was more expensive but for a while. Maybe that's put it out of our reach. Um, but uh, um, that was a nice relationship that I would like to see us continue. Yeah, okay. So um, thank you for those comments. I think in terms of the different types of resources, you know, if the, in the resource plan, it basically says that um, MBA has not established preferences for any particular type of renewable resource. Um, and, and so, what we see here on this chart, these are not targets uh, of, of different you know, technology types. These are, these are projections uh, based on you know, what we see in the market, what we've contracted for in the past. So when you're talking about geothermal, that absolutely could be in here. It really is going to depend on uh, if, a, if we see a good geothermal offer come our way. Um, unless there's a desire to establish certain targets for particular types of resources. I think we've, we've keyed that, or teed that question up in the past, and the response has generally been that the MEA doesn't have a, a particular preference for any specific type of resource, as long as it's a qualifying RPS. Um, on the question about the potential for a natural gas spike, that I will say, I've, I've been in the industry for 20 years, and I know enough not to try and predict uh, the unpredictable. And, and that's, that's one where it could happen, or we could be in a period of low gas prices for an extended period of time, and, and nobody, uh, if they're honest or, or <coughs> self-aware, is going to is going to tell you otherwise. So I think the, the key there is is just to uh, diversify and uh, you know, not try and time the market. Uh, and I think MBA has been very good at that, being disciplined in its purchases, even though there, there may be a large need going forward. You know, MBA has been taking relatively small bites at different points in time exposure to different market conditions. Question here. Um, is it true that this graph uh, assumes that renewables cost re ratio to system cost ratio is um, unchanging? Or in other words, renewables aren't getting cheaper. Is that, is that true over this period? an assumption that you're making over this period, because that's what the graph seems to be saying to me. For instance, you're showing declining wind power. Is that because wind is getting more expensive relative to system power? 
right? So um, the reason that wind is declining is that some of what's represented there is wind or um, some of the unbundled renewable energy certificates that are being purchased. So the you know, bucket three is, is now sort of the terminology in the state for that, that type of procurement. And so what's happening is over time that's being, that's being displaced by uh, primarily in-state bundled renewable energy procurement. And, and, the, and that's, that's the reason. There's, there's not a whole lot more um, wind being developed in California. There's some, but for the most part, it's being developed out of state. Uh, so when you buy that resource, what you're really buying is, a, is an unbundled renewable energy certificate. Uh, so the, uh, as the in-state solar and some biogas you know, starts to pick up and, and we're making the overall, uh, maintaining the 50% overall content, then what's getting squeezed are the, are the, the wind wind part. Um, in terms part of the squeezing wind rather than systems. Well, the, I mean, that's just a function of establishing the, the you know, the procurement target of 50%. So, if, you know, if the desire of this is to uh, let that 50% increase as the in-state resources were coming on, then, then you, know, you would see this overall upward slope, and you would see that squeeze in the system, and that, that may be something that we want to do. And I think it's also worth noting that uh, our primary goal here, uh, obviously, is, is promoting renewables and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and one factor in that really is what are we doing that in comparison to? Uh, obviously going to really mostly be in comparison to uh, what's offered by Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, the primary constraint to us here in, in many ways is cost competitiveness. Uh, one thing that uh, is not really, I don't believe is accounted for here, is that um, one thing we are seeing with PG&E is, is, is they are increasing their uh, renewables portfolio. Uh, there is absolutely a cost increase associated with that. Um, their recent annual electric trove statement showed that uh, to account for the new renewables they were adding to the system, they're going to be uh, increasing their rates by about a penny, a little more uh, per kilowatt hour, which is which is quite a bit. Uh, so as PG&E reaches other targets and uh, hopefully is successful in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, it may push us further towards needing to get more renewables. It also may give us more leeway to, uh, to to buy more renewables that might be a little more ex expensive, but still remain cost competitive with PG. And also, I mean, PG&E's uh, uh, requirement to meet the RPS going forward as well, and I think you're going to get into that a little bit, John, about bucket one, bucket two largely informs the subject of what kind of renewables priorities as well. Uh, yeah, I was just, it sounded like from what you said, John, that um, one of the movers of this would be to have more people going to green. And I was just wondering, I didn't see from um, the breakdown of this meeting, are we talking about any marketing efforts going forward? Because I think we have maybe 3,000 customers right now, and only 1,200 plus one <laughs> um, are deep green. And um, it's just a, I think it's a very attractive proposition for Marin, and if that's truly a driver in this, I just wonder if any marketing efforts are being made to really yeah. Put, yeah. push that. Yeah, you know, absolutely, you know, I think with, if until July, the program had 14,000 customers, and so now there's a whole bunch of new customers, and there absolutely is a concerted effort to, to increase participation in deep green as customers become familiar with MEA and, and that offering. <coughs> we expect that those numbers to go up significantly. Donna, do you have any specific numbers? Yeah, we do have a concerted effort underway to, to develop um, marketing along those lines or to um, do additional marketing along those lines. As John mentioned, we now, uh, proportionately, we have a lot more new light green customers. So that's why the percentage has changed of how many folks have chosen deep green. We were up at 6% before the, the mass enrollment of all the light green customers. So um, we're going to work towards um, increasing that number, and um, I think that will allow us some flexibility here. But I, I also wanted to make um, one other comment that, that what's shown here really is a this is the potential resource mix um, for the coming approximately 10 year period. And really, this is an opportunity for us to get feedback from the board on you know, what are the policy objectives that we have. And, and um, you 
know, is how does how does this compare with what, where we'd like to see the agency going? Um, the other comment I'd like to make in response to um, a question is um, that the contracts, the long-term contracts that we're entering into, are for California-based renewable energy. So the the system energy, we're not buying the long-term chunks of it. And so I don't want folks thinking that you know if, if this is what we decide we're going to do going forward, that we're going to lock into. Um, long-term contracts for system energy that we then can't change in 15 years per se. Um, the, the nature of the market kind of, um, uh, in, you know, kind of uh, makes it necessary for the system energy purchases to, to you know, bind those long out into the future isn't a good idea anyway. So um, that's not something that's being contemplated here. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Did you have another comment to add on that, Justin? No, I was okay. just... Great, so maybe we can move to the next slide, please. So um, this, this section here, we talk about now resource needs. So this gets to um, what's been contracted versus what's been open. And there's a lot more detail in the plan itself and tables if you um, are into that level of detail. These are, these are just the highlights. John, I wanted to stop you here. In the plan, um, it references Rio Solar. However, in the earlier presentation, it looks like that's now being omitted um, in the up, in the annual update. The location was moved. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, what's the had, status of Rio Solar? Yeah. So Rio Solar, and initially, the site that had been selected for that uh, project was Placer County, um, and the comment that we made in the morning presentation was that the location is now looking like it's going to be in Kings County. So the developer had. Um, or has the ability to uh, select a different location for the project. And so um, Kings County is, is uh, likely going to be the, the location for that project. So as far as we know, that project is still on track? Um, yeah, we, there are some concerns about it, um, but we are um, we're working to, um, to keep us up to date on information as we can. We're getting regular progress reports from the developer. Um, so we're, we're following it closely as we do other projects. Okay, so um, you know one of the things I think is, is probably one of the better kept secrets of, of MEA is the number of counterparties and number of con energy contracts, um, different energy contracts that it actually has, has entered into over the last few years. Um, right now, MEA has 14 different energy contracts with 11 different, different energy suppliers. So it's really not just Shell. Um, has been quite busy of late in, in contracting, primarily, actually exclusively with uh, for renewable energy projects. Uh, in terms of where, uh, how much is, uh, is is open versus how much is contracted, uh, essentially MBA is, is largely resourced or largely contracted for uh, its energy and capacity needs through, uh, through 2016. Now, this is a uh, this is, this is based on a planning assumption that for the Richmond expansion that the agreement with, with CENA is amended uh, and would carry through to 2016. If not for that, then um, NBA would be largely resourced through about 2015. So I just wanted to highlight that, that there are, there is, uh, there are some, some planning assumptions built into these, these, these figures. So, um, so that's the core of the you know, energy need is, is the actual physical energy capacity. The, the next category of resource relates to the voluntary energy purchases, and, and these are primarily the bucket three or the unbundled renewable energy credits. Uh, and MBA is, is largely covered through 2013. There will be some additional need uh, related to the expansion to Richmond uh, next year. But um, the vast majority of, of those those requirements are, are already under contract in 2013. And then just a, a note here, and I, I think I made reference to this earlier, but the, the general approach that that NBA uses, it has used, and, and anticipates continuing using, is really um, to manage the resources as a portfolio, kind of similar to think of an investment portfolio, <coughs> that, um, the importance of diversification. Not keep uh, not just going all in on one particular project, a massive uh, you know, a renewable project that, that may, if it, if it has a, a, a 
delay or uh, something falls out, it leaves you holding the bag. So the idea here is to assemble a, a diverse portfolio and balance a number of different considerations. Uh, cost, obviously, is one of them. Um, but also, you know, we like to see diversity among our counterparties. We don't want to be dealing with just one company, like, like many companies. Uh, diversity in, in project sizes. Uh, diversity of when we actually execute the contract, so you know, kind of that timing of, of purchase, uh, as well as uh, the length of the contract. So uh, that's kind of the buzzword. That's the, the key uh, operating principle, I think, it, it is trying to ensure that we, we build and maintain a diverse resource portfolio. Go to the next slide here, okay. Um, so in terms of then some procurement guidelines, so this gets a little bit more specific about how, how uh, management or staff goes about procuring these various types of resources. So the first category is bundled renewable energy. So you can think of this as bucket one if you're getting kind of acclimated to the new terminology um, related to the RPS. So this you know, uh, is typically going to be within California a contract where an MEA uh, buys the energy as well as the renewable attribute. Okay, so that's bundled renewable energy. Uh, also oftentimes comes, comes with capacity. These are typically long-term agreements because um, what's happening is MBA is causing this new resource to be constructed, it needs to be financed, so the developer needs a long-term power purchase agreement with the, with the agency in order to get that project financed and built. Uh, typically the terms are 20 to 25 years, although uh, there, there, there may be some shorter term, you know, the five to the overall range might be five to MEA's basic procurement, general procurement guideline here is to procure up to 100% uh, three to five years out. And the, uh, that timeline, because a couple of considerations here, one, there's a regulatory compliance obligation for this type of energy, so you don't, you don't want to be caught short. Um, and there's uh, three to five years is enough time for a resource to actually get constructed. So MEA procures up to 100% in this time frame. The range is more like um, 90 to 100% a year out, 80% uh, roughly two to three years out, maybe 60 to 100% uh, five years out. Uh, so the closer in we are, the more that, uh, uh, more of these resources that MEA wants to contract. And then on a longer term basis, and this I got to a question earlier, so longer term, we're talking five years, more than greater than five years out. Uh, the procurement target ranges from 50% to 80%, and that just really depends on, on market conditions. Um, whether you want to be closer to 50% or you want to be closer to 80%, it's really uh, leaves a little bit of flexibility uh, to take advantage of opportunities that might present themselves. So that's, that's the basic um, general procurement framework for bundled renewable energy. And the next category then would be the voluntary renewable energy purchases or the, the RECs. And this is a, a very different market. Um, there's a, an abundance of supply of, of this type of energy and it tends to be short-term type procurement. Um, so the, uh, the way MEA approaches this is, is really the shorts of midterm purchases, one to three years um, is about as far out as uh, has gone and anticipates going on, on these types of purchases. Um, and as mentioned earlier, uh, we expect that over time, uh, the bundled renewable energy will become a larger portion of the overall supply mix and the unbundled mix will become a, a smaller portion, uh, subject to any adjustments that uh, the board wants to make on the overall renewable energy targets. Then the next category of uh, procurement is system energy and what this is it really um, ultimately the energy comes from the, from the CAISO from the California Independent System Operator so when we think about system energy contracts what we're really talking about is a way to um, really hedge the price of that power that you're getting through the, through the ISO and these are typically short to midterm so you're talking one to five year type of contracts to give you that price protection. Um, in this market, 
you don't want to really go too long on system energy purchases because there is so much volatility or potential volatility that the longer you go out, the higher the price is because you're in effect paying uh, insurance value and that becomes prohibitively expensive. So NBA tends to, it's, uh, since inception, it's, it's been looking about five years out. Um, if you think about the original CENA contract, it was five years. That's about as far as you probably want to go um, and, and maybe a little bit shorter, to, 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 which would actually tend to reduce the, the overall cost there's a balance there between price certainty over time versus you know, the absolute lowest price. Then uh, finally, uh, there is capacity, and this is for the resource advocacy obligation. Um, this is, again, this is another regulatory compliance um, product that's necessary. So MEA tends to procure this on a core basis, similar to the renewables. Um, generally, uh, the capacity is purchased one to five years out potentially, uh, I mean, it hasn't done it yet, but potentially uh, you could consider signing capacity contracts for a little bit longer than that, maybe up to 10 years, between one to 10 years. Um, the other note here is that on some of the bundled renewable energy contracts, and long-term contracts, that, that often does often have capacity as well. Go to the next slide. Wait, before you do that, are we permitted to ask questions, Damien? Sure. Just on, on just two of them on, on this particular slide. Um, in the past, there had been some discussion about NBA possibly looking at the natural gas market and figuring out if there was an opportunity to perhaps procure a greater degree of natural gas um, to offset the cost of increasing renewables because natural gas is at a low, I believe, still now. So I'm just curious, where does that fit in I assume it's in the system energy bucket, but would love a comment on that. And then secondly, um, the capacity issue, and perhaps you guys have already dealt with this. I wanted to find out, is that part of the resource adequacy obligation? And is that, when you talk about pro procuring for capacity, it's the first time I've ever seen referenced with MEA that it, that's a, actually a, se a separate procurement strategy. So if you could just explain a little bit more about that. Okay, sure. So, um, take up capacity first. So the, that is, there's a regulatory uh, compliance obligation, the resource adequacy program. So right now, um, it's a year ahead obligation. So when we, in fact, we're gonna have to make uh, our compliance filing uh, next month. So we'll have to demonstrate that based on MEA's forecast of customers and load for calendar year 2013, that MEA has contracts in place for, for capacity sufficient to meet, meet those, those peak demands. Uh, there's talk of that going to a longer term program, so a year ahead of that you know, three year out obligation, which of course would influence uh, the procurement strategy as well. Uh, in regards to natural gas, so are you talking about um, purchases of electricity produced by natural gas? Is that what you mean? So, yeah, so. You use it as a, as a cost hedge right. to bring your overall portfolio down. Right, so that, that, would, that would fit within the system energy category. System energy is, you know, that's what you call it when you're not buying from a, a specified resource, but you could, your MEA could uh, buy from, let's say, the Calpine has a natural gas fire generator. Uh, MEA could uh, buy from that generator directly. And yeah, that would, in terms of the charts and, and the tables and whatnot, that would fit within the system energy category. Are you guys doing any of that um, on, on a, looking at natural gas as sort of a greater percentage of a transition fuel, or is that something that really is seen as taking care of? Well, it's, um, it's really, I think you can think of it as, as the same as system energy. And so, you know, what, uh, what MBA has been doing is, is really trying to manage an overall sort of 50%, 50% mix, right, between uh, fossil fuel slash system and renewable. So that's where, uh, that's where you do get, that's, that's how you, you, you keep the um, average cost of the portfolio down compared to, let's say, 100% renewable portfolio. So yeah, I think, suggesting is is reflected in, in you know, the way that the has been procuring and managing its portfolio. Okay, last question on capacity. Sorry. When you talk about contract terms varying from one month to ten years, so are you actually now contracting for capacity or that's just a layer that's a layer or a filter over which all of your procurement work 
It's a, it's a piece of the overall procurement strategy. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a separate product. It is separate. It's, okay. it's being purchased under separate agreements. Interesting. Okay. Is demand response now eligible to be um, considered as capacity? Yeah, with with some um, with some hoops you have to jump through. Yeah. yeah so it, it, in other words, uh, there's there's minimum uh, duration. I think it's four hours that. Uh, the, uh, the customer has to agree to reduce their load for a four-hour period, for instance. And there are some other uh, some other uh, restrictions on it, but you can use demand response to qualify and reduce your resource access to the application. Okay, so where were we? I think we were on the next slide. Yes. Now we're getting um, away from the guidelines and, and now onto procurement methods. So how um, how is NDA going to go about procuring its, its needs? And so uh, there's a few different uh, methods that have been used in the past and we expect to continue to use. And the first one would be uh, bilaterally negotiated or brokered agreements. Um, there's a lot of brokers out there that will try and match buyers and sellers and I mean, is, is used them on occasion. Um, where I MEA mean, typically would use uh, this type of procurement strategy would be for short to medium uh, term purchases of, of more standardized products. In other words, um, where the, the market has a lot of transparency, so there's not a whole lot of mystery in regards to what a, what a competitive price is, then you're a lot more comfortable just bilaterally negotiating an agreement. So things like um, conventional energy, system energy, that's, that's, that's fairly transparent. There are published market indices out there that you can benchmark to. Um, Bucket three renewables is a very liquid market, uh, a lot of competition, so that's that's something that uh, bilaterally negotiated agreements kind of fits well with, um, and also uh, potentially short-term one-way <coughs> energy. Um, uh, the, the, it, the other um, sort of type of, uh, of opportunity that you, you want to use bilaterally negotiated would be what we've called. We kind of we borrow this phrase from the utilities, to be honest with you, but, but we liked it so much that we use it. It's these unique fleeting opportunities or UFOs. Um, you know, this is one where there's a distressed asset, you know, time is of the essence, it's a great deal, and you know, you gotta jump on it. So, you know, that's one that's really opportunistic, but that's a um, that's a, an appropriate application for, for just by that way negotiating. Uh, and another category would be the more traditional competitive solicitation or request for proposal process. And MEO would use this um, typically for a long-term commitment where there's an uh, identified need. There's something in particular that MEA is after. And so um, we want to put a solicitation together and find that product and take bids in all the same time. Uh, obviously, you need, uh, you need a sufficient amount of time to, uh, to conduct such a, a, a procurement process. Uh, but it certainly has its place and we've done that with Grants, for instance, in the past. Um, then we uh, the open season process. I, I think you know, we're generally you're generally familiar with, but we developed that um, a year or so ago. And and this was uh, it's a competitive process um, that we just routinely conduct, annually conduct. We say, hey, we're we're looking at uh, proposals. Um, we use these for say less urgent or more opportunistic um, types of procurement. In, uh, but for long term, and so we, we see a lot of renewable energy, new, new um, renewable energy uh, proposals through our open season process. Um, and we expect we'll continue to refine that process, and probably raise the bar a little bit because we're still seeing probably more proposals than um, uh, well, you know, they're not all of them are of great quality, you know. So we might want to try and filter those out even even more through through some answers to that process. That's a, another main procurement mechanism that MBA uses. Uh, and then the, the last one, uh, you can generically call standard offer or we call feed-in tariff. And this is uh, for local projects, small local renewable projects. Um, and this is just a standing offer. We've got a, a, an agreement out there, kind of um, you come in and qualify, and you get the deal type of thing. Uh, we recently done the San Rafael Airport project. There's uh, we have applications. Kirby will talk a little bit more about the, the, the program later. Um, 
um, but I think we have applications up to the cap currently, so we may be looking at some expansion to that as well. The, the, the last section of the plan relates to procurement authority. And here we, we did a lot of thinking about uh, you know, as, uh, as the portfolio of supply contracts increases uh, and the, um, probably the, the term of some of these agreements compresses so that there's more shorter term uh, uh, contracts, uh, that it, it makes sense to uh, have established a different framework for authority for entering into power supply contracts. So what we've, uh, in the plan, we've developed a proposed hierarchy uh, of power procurement authority, which you know, involves, depending on the type of the, of the agreement or the commitment, it may involve the full board, may involve a subset of the board, or it may uh, uh, just sort of defer to, to management authority to execute. And I'll talk about um, each of those in a moment. Uh, I think we can just go ahead and skip to the matrix here. Next, next slide. So this is the table. So the way we've laid this out is the, you know, I guess the overarching procurement framework would be the resource plan that the board would adopt on an annual basis. And, and this would set out policies, objectives, um, any other sort of um, type policies that the board wants to establish and that it wants to hold management sort of accountable to. Uh, and then moving down from that would be any, uh, any capital project or uh, any type of procurement that would involve financing by MEA, uh, that would require board approval, um, board approval just because of the nature of the commitment. So, seemed like that didn't make a whole lot of sense to do anything other than to take a, a deal like that to the full board for consideration. The next category of um, procurement would be medium to long-term energy contracts, uh, which uh, would be consistent with an approved resource plan. So um, this is a scenario where you've got a resource plan, it lays out certain policies, it lays out certain you know, frameworks that we discussed, and then um, contracts then that are entered into consistent with that plan, uh, the authority would be jointly with the, the board chair and the executive director. Um, but this would only be after consultation with the contracts ad hoc committee. Uh, there's a reporting obligation here, a reporting requirement um, for any of these contracts that would be executed. They would be reported at the next month's meeting, a, a monthly reporting. Um, process for these uh, for these types of agreements and then moving to shorter term contracts where uh, this gets more into day-to-day -day operational um, mode eventually let's say MEA is, is, is moving in this direction not really uh, doing a whole lot of, of these to date uh, but I think as the as the procurement capabilities expand um, and maybe less of a role for some an entity like like Cena, then you'll see more and more shorter term contracts, less than a year. Uh, and here it really doesn't make any sense at all to, to bring up an agreement like that to the board. And so the proposal here would be for um, authority to, to reside with the executive director to execute those types of agreements, as long as it was consistent with them through a resource plan. Uh, and then report on that monthly as well. And then finally, there would be any other type of energy procurement, something not contemplated by the resource plan, um, that would require board pre-approval. So that's, you know, that's sort of the hierarchy that made sense when we sat down and thought through this, um, what would be an efficient sort of uh, process, balancing you know, like the obvious need for board oversight with the obvious need for management to you know, have some flexibility and efficiency in the process. Um, but we'd love to get feedback on, well, any of the plan that this in particular. For it, David, is, is there a point, a specific point for today's proceedings where we're going to talk about uh, overarching policy considerations with respect to MEA board? Is the expectation 
uh, to provide feedback as we go along. I'm a little confused about yeah, um, what the approach is. Progressing. Um, I think both. So really it's a question of, um, because obviously we need to have a discussion about this specific point, and we could probably do that right now, but I do want to have the overall discussion. I'm actually sensing kind of a time issue as well, Don. I, and really the key part of this whole retreat was the integrated resource plan and the policy objectives. So I'm actually just kind of thinking we're probably going to need to rearrange or cut some other things out to really complete this discussion is my sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple things as far as timing. I think that what we had envisioned was that we uh, focus on anything related to the integrated resource plan during this agenda item. There won't be a time in the afternoon where we circle back to this. Um, but that said, we have two, two things that I think we should keep in mind. One is we uh, had a sense that the morning session may go a little long. We weren't sure um, how much discussion would be included there. So we've left a pretty good cushion in the afternoon um, such that we could move the feed-in tariff discussion item six to occur after lunch and still have uh, adequate time to handle the two EE presentations that, that we expect, or three EE presentations that we expect. Um, so I think that that's one thing we could keep in mind as far as the timing of, of the day today. Well, and also I think if need be, I mean, we have heard a lot about the feed-in tariff recently in regular board meetings as well as EE. So, I mean, I think we really need to focus on that side of as well. So certainly, you know, I think we need to stay flexible on cutting the other items as well. Absolutely. And, and the other thing as far as, you know, our expectations around this item, the integrated resource plan was brought in draft form to TechCom at the last TechCom meeting. Um, so I wanted to invite TechCom members to, to speak up if you have um, comments about the discussion that happened there. Um, and then as far as the the action that we take today, this is the only item that we've shown as an action item. So the board could take action today, or we could come back to the board at another date after some discussion happens today um, and take action on approving this plan uh, at our next board meeting. Either either of those options will be perfectly fine. But I think that um, as um, uh, Director Connolly stated, we should spend as much time as needed to get input today because we're really um, looking to the board today to get some feedback and some policy direction. Well, and interestingly, I will note in terms of the tech comp that these same very issues were raised. So I think this is what's keyed up at this point. So. It's very helpful. Okay. Well, why don't we um, direct in our attention to, to the specific issue John's raising about kind of this procurement policy level of authority we're comfortable with, board role. Uh, executive officer. <coughs> Anyone have any thoughts on that? Or Just on, on the short term. Yeah. I mean, maybe there should be a dollar limit on it. I mean, I don't know if that it really correlates. You know, I mean, I assume most of your short term agreements are worth less, but I mean, it might be worth considering just saying any contract over whatever, 100,000 or 500,000 goes to the board as opposed to just basing it on time. Of length of contract basis. It seems to me you ought to have that there should be guidelines specific on the point. Uh, uh, there should be guidelines for both medium and short term. So that if it's within the guidelines, a dollar a time, whatever it might be, then you're there. If it's outside the guidelines, then you have to go to the resource to get it confirmed. And once, you, once we establish a matter of policy, the guidelines, then you're free to process it. I would suggest on the third item, where it says medium to long term, I'm just raise the question for my colleagues on the board. If we want to have, I mean, it's even for the protection of the executive director and the board chair, that if it's a long term contract, that's something that the board should probably weigh, have an opportunity at least to weigh in on, even if it is consistent, as it says, with the, with the resource, resource plan. I don't have a problem with short and medium, as, as Dick has said. If there's guidelines, but a long-term plan, I think should have board oversight. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, the idea of a, a dollar parameter or a time parameter did come up at TechCon. 
Um, so I think we are hearing from the board that that would be very worthwhile to have. Uh, John, th these fleeting opportunities that you were talking about, or if you have those <laughs> preclude, <laughs> whatever you're calling it, this preclude bringing them back to a um, board meeting? Do they have to be agreed upon in you know, like a week's time or something like that sort of No, I, I, the, the ones that you know, I, I've had in mind and we've seen in the past are not that time sensitive, that they couldn't be brought to the board. What it's probably, uh, they wouldn't be appropriate would be to try and funnel that into some RFP that might be happening you know, a few months down the line. It, it, does any of our procurement have to be done within a week or two that could not be back, brought back to a subsequent board? Um, probably, you know, not so much today. I would say, you know, I think we're we're trying we're trying to look forward here uh, because you know today the just about the entirety of the energy is through through the CNA agreement, um, and so we do some short term adjustments to that, uh, particularly on the capacity side. Um, but, but that's a, that's a little bit different animal, so. I think to answer your question, I, I, I think today, no, I, I don't think there is any short-term procurement that uh, is so urgent, uh, or that it's actually it's not taking place at all, is it, it, the reality of the situation. But we're trying to look forward uh, to a day where you know, MBA is a little bit more active. And, 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 and at what point would you anticipate that might happen? I mean, you're talking about a year from now, or five years from now? Or I think it would, it would slowly start to uh, take shape and it might start with some of the shorter term renewable opportunities that you know, we haven't looked at in the past and then you know probably in, over the course of the next five years really get sort of more mature so and I, I, I don't think it would be five years from now that you know we'd, we'd wait to get to that point I think it would start now but it would be pretty limited um, you know every now and then someone brings us, let's say, a, a one-year renewable deal, we're not really that interested because um, we don't have a good process to, to really deal with that type of an opportunity. Um, so I think, I think with a little bit more flexibility for shorter-term agreements, um, we'd probably, probably start using it. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, like, I like Richard's idea. I mean, I think flexibility is really important for work to get done um, but on the other hand we have to answer to our constituents too so if there could be if there's been enough consistency in the kind of contracts that we've already written to be able to establish some simple guidelines of what we buy what we're interested in the type, types of things that are acceptable um, then if it isn't you know maybe that could be done through one of the ad hoc you know commissions now and then just brought back to us so if it meets that parameter, it shouldn't have to come back to us. It should be that Dawn should be able to respond to that. I mean, that's just yeah. yeah if it's bucket one, exactly. two years or less. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> just as simple. We've already agreed to it. Yeah. No reason to say the right. you know every little word. Does that make sense, John? Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it absolutely does make sense. I, I think um, maybe. Uh, I don't know what the appropriate committee would be. Maybe the contracts ad hoc would be an appropriate place for TechCom to uh, try and refine some of the guidelines. I think I would suggest that the staff prepare for us some proposed guidelines because you know you know the terms of the contract. Put them in and bring them to the committee, and then if the committee approves it, bring them to the board for final approval. Mm -hmm. Just a matter of process. Or, you know. Four. Uh, so I'm not sure. My comments don't have to do with this specific subject area, and I don't know whether this is an appropriate time to more broadly address policy questions I see which adhere to the nature of, of what we're doing. And here's I just, I don't want to be too little, too late. No, here's what I would propose, and let's see if that makes sense. So if we've exhausted the procurement, uh, issues specifically and I think we do have direction for you now Don come back with some proposed guidelines along the lines we're talking about it's 1230 what I would propose is that we tee up some bigger issues um, 
and then break for lunch okay. and come back and, and address them. I mean, one thing, for example, right off the top of my head, bigger issue is that we know that the uh, Cena contract only runs through 2016. In terms of integrated resource planning, what is the plan post-2016 in terms of Cena, no Cena, you know, what are our alternatives? I mean, it sounds like you have some other issues in mind, Ford. Why don't you start off okay. talking um, about that? Well, that's a, that's a really good place to start because what I want to address uh, broadly could go under the category of uh, the difficulty uh, of talking about unpleasant realities. And the Cena contract is, is really the poster child for that because while our marching orders include greenhouse gas reduction in totally good, totally legitimate, laudable uh, aim and practice, in doing that, there can be dramatic adverse environmental consequences. And certainly Shell Oil uh, is an entity uh, which has raised tremendous controversy with respect to our con contract with it for renewable energy in connection with its aim uh, to drill in the, in the Arctic Circle. And so that's one of those unpleasant kinds of realities that generally are hard to talk about, but I think is really important not only to acknowledge and address, but to really look at those consequences as part of our decision-making process and whether or not the benefits to be obtained are worth the adverse consequences that you, you have to endure so that at least um, we're conscious and, and not asleep at the switch. And, and so Cena certainly is, is right up front and center for those reasons. And I, I think part of what's going on with, with us, with the MEA, is that we're going through a, definitely going through a growing period and how we want to go about developing and how we want to grow uh, ought to be part of the picture. And I think one of the parts of the picture that's important is the idea I think Larry mentioned earlier is the idea of, of, of energy independence. I pressed the button. Shut that thing up. I can't shut the shut her up. <laughs> Um, is, is the idea of, of energy independence. Uh, greenhouse and gas reduction, again, important objective, but I don't think it's the only one. And certainly when MEA started, uh, what I heard uh, in the initial public meetings was a, a lot of desire from the general public to be able to have energy independence. And the way for us, to facilitate that, as I see it, uh, would be through financing, and would be through financing solar uh, on individual rooftops. And so I think uh, the, the notion of, of energy independence ought to be part of what our growth objective is. It isn't just to be a successful uh, energy provider, uh, but to be an independence enabler, if that's not an oxymoron, uh, <laughs> also. Uh, other, other issues that, that come up, uh, and I think that what included in our policy should always be an analysis, at least, of what are the long-term environmental consequences. Just because there is the objective of greenhouse gas reduction doesn't necessarily obviate any analysis of what environmental harms may be. For example, with respect to balancing out our portfolio with natural gas pur purchases. 
are the, if we were to do that, and the corporations from which we would make those purchases, do they participate in fracking? And what, what's the consequence of fracking? And do we want to support fracking? I would say not. I would say that that would run directly contrary to what I certainly understand what our objectives are, or what I understand is, whatever, uh, and, and, it, with a, and with respect to a lot of other people. So let me get I, that sit on this board. So overall, I mean, I recognize that in practical life, uh, you have to sometimes make a deal with the devil in order to get what you want. And you have to go through an analysis of what the lesser of two evils may be. Uh, but what I really want to see uh, us do is be explicit about it. Uh, and that, that harkens back to the unpleasantness and the difficulty of confronting unpleasant realities. I think we'll gain much more public respect, much more credibility, and ultimately have an easier job for ourselves if we're honest about what the nasty consequences may be of the positive aspirations that we're trying to enact. So that's my tee up. Good, good, good start. Um, anyone else have any bigger issues? Let's just tee them up, take a short break for lunch, and come back and really have a good discussion, and maybe kick the rest of the agenda if it looks like we need to do so. Go ahead, Mike. I want to uh, echo and support what Ford said about the idea of the PACE program that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And what we need to hear from staff, or at least I need to hear, and I'm sure my colleagues do, is, is how realistic is it that if we really had a, 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 an up and functioning PACE program, similar to what Sonoma County had, or even, even and I realize the limiting factor with PACE is the money, and financing, and where's that money going to come from? but our organization can certainly put the energy into doing that. Will that make the difference in your in your chart that you had up there of the percentage of renewable energy if you get uh, several thousand households with rooftop solar? I, I mean, if that's just 1%, it means nothing that we need to, I need to understand it, but I don't have any concept of if there's several thousand homes that get through a PACE program that get a solar energy uh, uh, panels uh, up top, but that will truly make a difference towards along the lines of what we're talking about. That's, that's what I think, if, if that's realistic, but I think our organization should be putting a lot of energy towards that, no pun intended. All right. Just, um, and I've mentioned this before, getting some kind of an inventory of what our public resources are, um, because uh, there is a lot of solar capacity probably in publicly owned lands, public buildings, uh, that are there that sh should be developed. I mean, I, I think our public agencies should really be the role models uh, for what we want the residents to be doing. And we need to be leading the way and somewhat biting the bullet um, short term to create long term resources as public agencies, uh, not only of our jurisdictions, but for example, the Water District, which is the largest single consumer of electrical power in Marin County. What, what can we do with, what resources does the water district have? Can we do micro hydro through distribution lines where we're, we're generating electrical in, uh, through Marin Water District distribution lines? Is there solar capacity um, on MMWD land that could be developed without you know, really harsh environmental impacts? So, um, you know, it just really uh, underscores Ford's tee up, really, of uh, the broad question of, you know, the, the, the consequences and price of, of what we want to do and, and, and being explicit about it so that people understand why we're making the decisions that we're making. Ken? Yeah. You know, I just think that incorporating these two positions. <coughs> is to set forth what our, our goals are with regard to energy procurement, um, membership in MEA, you know, what, what are we proposing? 
with regard to conservation efforts. It's a general umbrella of really what we're here for. And I think a lot of these things fall into that. And if we don't have a specific statement under, agreed to by our communities, um, we're just sort of picking and choosing as we go along. I, and I don't, think that's, I don't think that's a good way of doing it. I think we really need to break it into the different parts of what this organization is and actually figure out what we want to do and how we want to get there. Steve. Um, I would just like to encourage you to think about um, this target, you know, where you say more than 50% will be renewable energy. I think if you could include as a goal uh, with an ever increasing percentage of uh, renewable content, that would give you, without knowing where it's coming from, a goal and a, and a direction that could be reflected in that resource mix matrix and just in the future thinking policy decisions we have to make of the my suggestion. I'd like to follow on that and just to encourage the board to um, aggressively reduce reliance on system power as well as aggressively reduce the reliance on RECs to balance our, our portfolio. Damon. It's Sean. <laughs> it all goes along in a line here, but I think to key off, Len, what you said, it would be really interesting to understand, and it, it would be part and parcel of that chart that you guys did, your integrated resource chart, to understand what are the menu of options that you've got. And you've laid out a goal of 10 megawatts for feed-in tariff, which I think is great, and that's some specificity there. What would PACE look like if we were able, ever able to get it financed? What kind of impact would it have in your overall integrated resource? But also, has there been any research done on even co-investment opportunities on larger, maybe regional-based energy generation assets? That, that's something that has been talked around the edges in past years, but that would be part of a menu. Um, where are we with respect to financing, um, bonding capacity, long-term financing plans, all of that? Energy efficiency is a supply resource. I know um, Kirby's going to be talking about that. but this sort of menu of ownership, local <coughs> and ownership opportunities, offsetting the overall system power and also offsetting the amount of, the number of power purchase agreements, the rent own debate, would be an interesting overlay to that chart that you guys do. Um, I just have a really basic question. Um, and one of them, maybe it's related to my my industry, but um, we have a lot of people, in, I'm a real, realtor, and we have people that move out of the area and people that move into the area. So after the programs are there and, and the cities have, you know, said, yes, we're going to be in, in uh, you know, we're in MEA, um, but when a person calls up to discontinue their service, they call up PG&E, and when they, they call to put in a service, they call up PG&E. So what I'm wondering, is there a retention? you know, program, or is there something of, is there a number that they should call saying, um, are they getting an opt-out notice when they are a new, yeah, I mean, it's just a really basic question, but it's a question that I don't know how to answer for my clients, and, you know, I see, uh, you know, 100% flow all the time of in and out, and I'm just looking long-term of, you know, when people move in and out of Marin County, or do we have a retention program? That's, that's actually a very quick one. Um, folks are automatically enrolled in to MEA, but they do receive an opt-out notice after their enrollment. They do. Um, and they have a 60-day window to opt out um, during the statutory period, or they can choose to opt out later. Um, but some new move-ins into Marin anywhere are, are defaulted. It is an MEA service. PG&E should inform people when they sign up for service that they're in the Franklin Energy Service area and therefore will be enrolled. Uh, however, we it's been my experience that PG is not, they're not always communicating. No, they're not doing that. Because I've asked my clients when they've moved, you know, what happened to you when, when you when you called up for your service and they said, I just you know, called up for my service. So I'm wondering if there isn't some leakage, you know, that's occurring back to PG and E 
Um, <coughs> because it's just, you know, they, they, they're going to get something in the mail, they're moved, they're, moved, they're going to throw it away thinking it's just a bunch of other, you know, par uh, paraphernalia. So I guess what I'm concerned about is looking at the charts that stay sort of static, it's like, is it saying static because we're losing? No, we, we actually have a lot of uh, new accounts that we get periodically. Um, PG gives us data anytime there's a new account number within the service area. Uh, and we absolutely do have that, the increase there. So. Okay. But is a new energy hookup automatically in MEA? That's correct. And with, they're within the service area for MEA. So all we're in county now is. Um, once we our implementation expands to Richmond and we start offering service there, then that will apply in Richmond as well. So when your customers call up PG, they should automatically be an MEA, right? Well, That's they true. are, but but maybe some of them don't want to be. You know, so it's a matter of choice because when they start talking around and then all of a sudden they find out, well, wait a minute, you know. But that's the same as everybody else is back. They get the opt-out notices. They get a couple of them, right? We, we send notices to those customers. each e is also supposed to be telling them that they're within our service area and will be getting their electric generation service from us. Um, but I have received some reports that e e has not been always doing that. Okay, well, let me direct it back. Do we have any other further um, big issues? Just big real quickly, I, the, other, the other side of the equation is the energy efficiency right. program. So I don't think we should lose sight of that because that's going to be the direct in the community dollars that we can be directing. That's going to build customer loyalty. And, yeah, and that is in the us. in the plan now. The question is, yeah, it should, what level of, of discussion and emphasis should it have? It is absolutely. It, it's a, it should be so, a, big, a big piece of it. Okay, yeah. well, good. Yeah, we've added that to the list. So any further kind of tee up bigger issues? Okay, well, why don't we take a quick break for lunch? Okay, so I think the way we're going to proceed uh, is in addressing some of the broader issues that we've identified. We actually are going to have a chance to talk about some of the specific issues that were already teed up for the afternoon agenda, including the feed in tariff program and energy efficiency. I know there's a number of speakers here, uh, particularly on energy efficiency. So we'll get to you. Um, broadly speaking, uh, a couple of overarching issues that were identified are energy independence as well as environmental consequences. <clears throat> the first issue that, uh, and I'm going to just kind of go through a very broad outline of some of the topics and then turn it back over to staff uh, to really delve into uh, the SENA contract. Where are we headed with that? Local production, and that's where we really get into the feed-in tariff program, net energy metering, PACE, uh, SB555, which we're going to hear a little bit about today, which is a PACE-like program. Uh, energy efficiency, the importance of that in terms of our overall objectives. Potential ownership of assets, how that may fit into a procurement strategy. And again, the aspirational procurement goals we have. I think we uh, had a good discussion about that this morning and really just kind of getting some uh, language that we can include in, in the uh, uh, the resource plan along those lines. And then again, environmental consequences, really reaffirming uh, our, our uh, objectives in that regard and, and perhaps revisit the chart we saw this morning and, and dig a little deeper into where we're going in that regard. Okay, hopefully I haven't missed anything, but I'm sure we'll, we'll bring it up along the way. We're actually uh, shooting for about a 350 uh, end time. 350? <laughs> Some of us have four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> 352. <laughs> 10 minutes between here and the Civic Center. Is, uh, I'll finish it. All right. You want to take a lottery here? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're 355. 355. Okay, so now our podium's over here. Uh, who are we gonna hear from first? John, you wanna, or Don? 
Um, I'll make a couple of comments. Can folks hear me from here? Yeah. I, since we're kind of having a dialogue here, I'm going to stay here then if that's OK. Um, I think the first topic that um, Director Connolly laid, laid out is our SENA contract, our contract with Shell Energy North America. And I think that's a great place to start because it really is um, one of the driving forces behind developing an integrated resource plan. We, when we started and prepared to serve, uh, serve customers throughout Marin, we needed to have an energy supplier that could provide all of the power that we needed right at the beginning of the time that we needed to provide it. And so this was really viewed, and in many cases it was referred to as a bridge contract, a contract to get us from the beginning of service to the point where we could begin to control the resources um, on our own and layer in the types of contracts that we wanted uh, with, with a diverse supply, a lot of different counterparties, diverse products, uh, solar, wind, geothermal, conventional, all the products that we need, and layer them in at different times so that we're not buying all of our power in one year that's gonna then keep us going for 20 years. That, that could be risky because the market changes. You know, every few months you see different prices. So this Shell contract was a way to get started. And we are now, although 2015, uh, 2016 doesn't seem that far away, um, we need to plan ahead for when that contract um, is no longer serving our needs. And so this is really an opportunity for us to think about what do we want our supply portfolio to look like after that time frame. Um, do we want to take on more, do we want to, um, what, what types of counterparties do we want to work with? What types of resources do we want to have in our mix? And, um, and at what point in time would we want to begin developing projects ourselves? I know one of the things that was mentioned is um, some of the local public opportunities that might be available in order for those to, since those aren't coming to us through our feed and tariff or through developers, that's something we would need to take a, a proactive role in getting up and running. So that would mean MEA as developer, potentially. So those are some of the things that we need to, to think about as our shell contract is preparing to, to come to a close. Now it's, it's likely that we're going to need to get power from Shell for a little bit longer as we prepare to make that transition to um, buying from other resources. But I think that's a place to start. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say kind of to, to lay out the discussion that we're about to have is that the, the chart that we were looking at, while it was a, a potential resource plan for the, the next 10 years, it doesn't necessarily um, look at what is, as we discussed, what, what are our aspirational goals? And you know, in our implementation plan and in our mission statement and our founding documents, we talk about the, the goal, the overall goal of getting to 100% renewable energy content within cost constraints, you know, while, while, having, while continuing to offer a competitive product. And that hasn't changed. So I think that um, while we talk about the, the practical resource planning, we need to keep that in mind, that our, our vision and our goal and our mission statement hasn't changed. And so um, that, that's something that, that we should keep in mind as we go forward. And I, I'd like to spend a little time, I know later on in the next agenda item, we're gonna dive a little deeper into the feed-in tariff program and how we can get more local renewable projects coming to us through that feed-in tariff program, making sure that they come in at a cost that we can afford and that we can have as many of them as possible. We, want, we can talk about PACE and, and that as a way to get um, uh, more uh, local installations of solar and more EE. And then we're going to talk about EE. We have a couple of um, folks here that are going to speak to us about energy efficiency programs and how we can really shave that demand that we have over time. So um, maybe, maybe the first place to start is to get feedback from the board about um, what types of contracts, you know, are, are there adjustments that we want to make to the proposed plan that you have before you? Or Don, uh, my general <coughs> recollection is that uh, with Shell Oil, it's not just energy we're getting uh, from it, uh, but also administratively, uh, it bears a pretty big Burden. And could you just briefly review for us what those what that burden is that it, it does bear administratively? Because if my memory is right, uh, it's, it's it's pretty substantial, and we have a high level of dependence 
on those administrative functions. Yeah, there are a couple of really critical functions that Shell provides to us. Um, one is really shaping our load. So we have, of course, a variable load. We, we use more at certain hours of the day, we use less at other hours, and the energy supply coming into us doesn't always match that. So, so they do what's called load shaping. They also do scheduling, which means that they, um, they, let, they interface with KISO and let KISO know what our demand is gonna be on an hourly basis and, um, and what, how much supply we're putting onto the system on an hourly basis. And so balancing all of that um, requires a lot of um, attention and it requires that they have staff and a trading desk um, active um, you know, at, at many hours of the day and night when, when we don't have folks um, on staff doing that. So um, those are critical functions. And, some of those functions we may transition over to MEA over time, um, but currently they are doing a lot for us. And, and as John mentioned, and I'll let him add add to your, to uh, the response to your question, but um, we also buy from them conventional power, renewable power, and capacity, so resource adequacy. We, we buy all of those products from them, um, and that allows for some administrative simplicity on our end. We're, we're validating one contract on a monthly basis, whereas going forward, if we were working with five or 10 or more vendors, that's a lot of a lot more administrative oversight on our side to make sure that um, all of those contracts are being followed and that we're getting the products that we need. Can I add just one thing? One of the really most significant things that Cena is providing to MEA is um, uh, basically they're providing credit in the market on MEA's behalf. So as a startup entity a couple of years ago, uh, MEA really didn't have any credit to speak of or any um, uh, access to significant access to capital. And in this industry, when you're buying power from, um, from companies, you need to be able to post, either have a credit rating or post collateral or a letter of credit, something like that. So MEA was unable to do that. And to, you know, to some degree, is still limited in that capacity. So that's a, a real, um, Critical role that the supplier in this stage of MEA's development at the startup and still today is is providing. Now that the, the need for that declines over time as MEA sort of stands on its own feet, gets its you know credit rating, you know uh, access to capital markets improves, then that becomes much less important. But um, that was really one of the one of the key values that they, they brought to the table and still provide. Right. So 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 it's, it's credit. <coughs> is shaping and scheduling and it, it do have you given any thought that if we didn't have the benefit of shell's expertise whether or not uh, mea has got the capacity staff wise and expertise wise putting aside credit uh, to be able to discharge the functions that Shell presently assumes? Not today. Not today, but what, that my, what my question is, it's not whether we could do that today, but whether or not you've given any thought to whether or not we could do that in the future, and if so, how and, and what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, the answer is yes, and you know, we could talk about each of those for the four critical functions that, that we just laid out and the timing on each of those. I think um, as far as uh, scheduling goes, there are other vendors out there that could supply that to us. Uh, it's something we could take on in-house, but it would mean kind of a 24-7 uh, person or two kind of handling that. That might be something we could outsource to another uh, vendor that does, that primarily does scheduling for other parties. Um, and we have, we've already actually looked into that and, and know couple of options for that. Um, we could procure our RA through other sources, or resource advocacy through other sources. Um, uh, a shaped product it would be more expensive, so we, but that's something we could buy from other companies. Um, and then as far as credit, we've, we've had some discussions with, um, with folks that have expertise in this area, and from the information that we've gathered to date, we think that within the next year or so, uh, after you know, now that we've achieved full rollout, and uh, as we build 
some operational history at full rollout. We think that within the next year or so, we would likely be successful if we um, went to get a credit rating of our own, and we might want to couple that with a, a bond issuance, and we could do that bond issuance to either prepay for power or to develop maybe a small project here in Marin. So that's something that um, we'd like to consider doing within the next year. So, so I think that um, each of those activities that Shell is currently providing are things that we can start to transit, transition over to MEA over the next few years, but it's certainly not something we're prepared to do today. Well, one, one of the things that we're really kind of already doing, one of the transitions that's already in place, and that's you know what we're talking about here is just transitioning uh, responsibilities as part of a, uh, you know, a, a movement towards gaining uh, greater independence in terms of the energy uh, issue and the supply that we're dealing with here. One of the things that we're already doing to facilitate that tran transition is entering into long-term agreements with renewable energy suppliers. So this is something that, that at the uh, outset, Shell was entirely responsible for meeting all of the different uh, services and, and needs that Don mentioned, um, and in particular, renewable energy. And what we did very early on in the process was start transitioning to managing these contracts independently, entering into those contracts managing them independently. So I see that as something that's it's already in the works. That's more of a uh, potentially a nearer term focus that the agency does currently have the technical capabilities to go out to contract for the entirety of its renewable energy needs. And so I think that's something that should really be a bogey. Um, I don't know, in the next, say, well, by the time that uh, the current agreement is, is uh, anticipated to expire, mm -hmm. that we would be at a point where we can really go out and contract for the entirety of those uh, RPS, or Renewable Energy Obligations Independent. Okay. Well, so, uh, to uh, ask a follow-up question on Ford, where I'm hearing, Cena provides all these services, and as we grow as an organization, we're slowly able to take over more of them. What's our operational philosophy, though? Are we trying to grow in-house the staff a little bit, or are we trying to stay perhaps smaller and, and manage through a series of, of consultants or outside contracts? What's going on, like for example, Noble Energy Systems provides a huge amount of services for us. We're not trying to take in-house all those things that they do. It's more cost-effective to contract with them to provide them for us. So same sort of questions with Cena. I understand Cena represents perhaps a political issue for the organization of the board. But my question is an operational question, huh? what, and I open that to my colleagues as well, what the vision is going forward. Stay small and contract out as much as possible or slowly grow the organization to cover some of these things. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's I the first one this year. <laughs> the first great question. <laughs> <laughs> no. At least the second. <laughs> I think there are some services that it really does make sense to contract out for, um, and Noble is a great example of that. They, they have um, some technical um, capacity um, through you know, technology that they've acquired that allows them to handle a huge and really enormous amount of data every day for us. And for us to have the capacity to do that, it would be a significant investment, and um, they already have have it in-house, know how to use it, and have the technical capacity to do it really efficiently. So I think um, continuing a relationship with them in the, in the same way that we, that we have set up now is, is probably going to be the best option for MEA rather than bringing that in-house. Um, and you know, there are each of the things we just laid out, the, the four functions that Shell is doing for us, um, I think we could have a discussion about each one to see you know, which ones we want to bring in-house or not. I think that within the next two to three years, um, transitioning to another scheduling supplier will, would make some sense based on what's out there in the market. But I think each thing needs to be looked at on its own. We need to get a sense of what would it cost for us to bring it in-house and what would the continuing ongoing cost be for us to, to keep it external. Um, we, we did go through a, a transition over the last couple of years with some of our regulatory legal costs that were be done, being done initially um, through an external consultant. And we made a decision to bring some of that in-house and have two staff now dedicated to that. We've been able to achieve significant cost savings um, by doing that. 
and um, that could be true for some other functions as well, um, but not for all functions. So I, I think it's something we need to look at, um, you know, one category at a time. Yeah, I agree that over time you should do, and but as an overall philosophy, though, I think that there should be some discussion about that by this board. If our goal is is in general is to stay a, a, a smaller organization, not to ever become an organization that has hundreds or a thousand employees, but a relatively smaller organization that oversees and manages different consultants as a, as a general or yeah. organizing principle. I think one touchstone for us all to keep in mind with that in our, in our business plan, our implementation plan, the rough number of staff that we anticipate MEA needing to manage all the functions that are anticipated is about 20. And I don't think that that's changed substantially. Um, it, it might need to go up a little bit because of the addition of Richmond, which wasn't contemplated at the time of the original plan being developed. But um, I think that's probably a good size. I, I don't see uh, the agency needing to get much bigger than that. Great, thank you. Um, well, you just answered my first question. Yeah, you, so you would anticipate 20 or 25. But that's certainly not going to do all of the four functions that Cena provides for us, I wouldn't think. Uh, Cena, obviously, in the early, when we set this thing up, was a very significant negative in many people's eyes. And we received a lot of criticism for that. Is that still an issue, do you think? Or is that sort of fallen into the background? Is it not that much of a concern now? Obviously, on the part of yeah. not one or two people, it is, but uh, on the part of the public and our and our customers. I think it's still an issue for some, and and I think that um, what most of the public isn't aware of is that the, the you know Shell is providing power to pg e as well. So it's you know it's not really a, a big difference um, if they move to us. Is that a strong argument point? <laughs> no, because I don't think that it's. Resonated. I, you know, I think it's worth noting, but I, I don't think it's resonated. Um, so I, I guess I don't. I don't think um, really what, what I think is important when it comes to our interaction with Shell and with any other company, because ultimately we're if if we want to do business in the in you know with energy providers, we're going to have to um, make decisions about. You know, we're, at, from time to time, we're going to need to work with companies that have baggage and and have um, where there are public concerns about working with those companies based on things that they do beyond their MEA contracts. And I think that what we've said before and and should continue to to stick to is that we are helping these companies move in a in a greener direction just by contracting with them for these greener products. And while we can't control what Shell or other companies do with other counterparties, they will sell what the buyer wants to buy. And so if we, if we insist on or select a greener product, then we're helping them to green up their portfolio. And by doing that, we're helping to lead the market in the right direction. Uh, in the same way that we're setting up a, we're, we're setting a new bar for the other for the utilities to follow. I mean, we've seen their their um, renewable content has already changed dramatically since since we began offering service. We we probably can't take all the credit for that, but I think we can take some because it's rather embarrassing for them to put out an RPS that's um, so far below ours. Um, they've also recently developed a deep green esque type of product that they're now um, taking and looking to offer to customers, and I think. Um, we can take some credit for that as well. So by, by setting the bar where we're setting it, we are pulling along the energy companies that have made different decisions in the past. Um, some might characterize them as bad decisions that they've made in the past or, or um, uh, you know, and, and we're able to push them in a different direction and um, help to change the market at the same time that we're offering a better product to our customers. And I, so I, I think when we talk about the behavior of our counterparties when they're interacting with others in the market, while we can't necessarily control it, um, we can certainly push them to do what's important to our customers and our board. And it's not gonna be just <coughs> Shell that we have those issues with. There are other, other energy suppliers that um, we, 
we may want to do business with going forward because of the products they offer, the flexibility they offer, um, the prices that they offer, and we may run into the same issue over and over again, but again, I think we're, we're moving them and the market in the right direction if we continue to procure the greener product. Well, just, just to be the devil's advocate, I think we need to be aware that the more of the obligations or more of the services that we take on from Cena, the more of that baggage may be shifted to us. And I think we just need to be aware of that as we take on these, any or all of these new four functions. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, Could you see Cena is, 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 has, receives a great, or we received a great deal of negative response two or three years ago. From because, simply because we were getting procuring energy from Cena. A lot of it was easier because people really had no idea what Cena did. They didn't realize that PG&E bought a great deal of the energy from Cena. So we got this sort of knee-jerk reaction from a lot of people who really didn't understand the issue. And I'm afraid some of that will come back to haunt us. Uh, and I'm, I'm simply being devil's advocate. I think we need to be aware of those things uh, the more we take on. I mean, you know, we're going to buy power from somebody. You know, we, we're going to obviously we've been focusing on renewable project developer, developers to because that's you know where we're trying to transition off of the Cena contract, but that's you know five six year time horizon. But when uh, MEA is at the point where it's let's just say managing completely, it's it's gotten away from this one supplier you know uh, agreement, and now it's it has many suppliers. Well, they're they're, they're still energy companies. Right, so um, you know this industry is unfortunately it's, it's not you know, all rainbows and butterflies. I mean these are these are energy companies that build power plants, and so we can maximize the use of renewable resources that are used. Um, we can focus on local resources and energy efficiency to the greatest extent possible, and reduce overall requirements. But there's still going to be this residual amount of energy that you need to buy from the market, right? So I think uh, seen as just one sort of example of that is the one that's the most predominant counterparty that NBA has right now. Um, but I think you know we sort of need to be realistic about when you're out buying power, these are the types of firms that, that sell it. Right. Yeah, they're very they're very diversified. That's enough I mean when you when you hear the word baggage, I think another way to look at baggage is uh, you know they're di they're diversified companies. Uh, these are folks that are often involved in the oil and gas industries in addition to power production. And so um, I think one of the things that that we all need to be mindful of is that when we go forward and maybe bring certain things in-house and, and choose to leave other things out with various market participants is that there's there's a considerations that need to be given uh, to being overly prescriptive in what it is that we want to do um, and, and the criteria that we kind of impose on, on other folks and generally those uh, being pres prescriptive has costs that come with it, and those costs will inevitably be passed through to our rate payers, and so I think that's just something that needs to be uh, considered as well. Larry. Gotcha. Barbara had a hand up first. When we do more, okay, well, well, I was just going to say a few items. Okay, that's fine. Uh, you know, Shell, I, I don't think it's their business activity that generates the controversy. I think it's their human re rights record, which is deplorable. And maybe the agency, when it goes out for um, a new contract, needs to keep that in mind. I mean, maybe there's some, you know, less bad actors that we can be dealing with. So, you know, that, uh, I mean, I know we've got to be cost conscious, but, you know, as a public agency, uh, maybe we need to also have other criteria that we keep in mind because uh, I was at a function, actually Dawn was there a couple weeks ago, and there's just a visceral response against Shell because of its activities uh, in Nigeria and its association with, you know, just horrendous, um, you know, volumes of uh, human rights violations. So, you know, I think it's something we should, you know, talk about and consider when we go out for, for contracts, and maybe that's something we do need to fold into our criteria going forward. Hopefully we have the opportunity to be that selective in going forward. I'll give you another political one. When we buy our renewable energy with some of the companies I, I think are 
are Chinese based and that has political repercussions as well as opposed to buying from an American based company. But, I mean, and so I don't know how politically charged this board wants to be, but that's, those are all considerations for us to be aware of as we go forward. Barbara. Thanks. Um, I have been um, fielding questions and outrage about Shell ever since we signed the contract. Um, but I have noticed uh, a very large increase lately, and I think that we need to be aware that the um, drilling in the Arctic that is being planned by Shell is is a number one, I think it might be the top Sierra Club priority right now. And other environmental groups are taking that on as a very, very important um, activity. So I think we are actually seeing a much bigger um, uh, you know, problem with the Shell um, name associated with us even though we've already had. And all this, this isn't even addressing the Nigerian uh, problems, but also I think you know the Chevron problems in the Bay Area. I don't think that things are going to shift to Chevron. I think they're going to be oil company, bad oil companies. You know, is going to be a big, big deal. And Sh and Shell is actually at the top of that list nationally. And my concern has to do with the um, other CCAs that are um, potentially forming around the state and. I know that San Francisco is considering a shell contract. I think others um, may be doing that. And you know, I have to say that I, you know, I think Shell has done a great job for us. I think that there were a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I ultimately decided that of the three or four um, options that we had for the um, full requirements contract, that Shell was by far the best. Uh, and I'm glad that we had that opportunity. Um, because I frankly don't think we would have made it out of the box if they if they had been you know our supplier or really don't I think that that's how crucial they've been to us um, and I think that they still you know obviously are providing a lot of, of services that are you know that are key that we can't really do without we could possibly get them somewhere else or we could get another full requirements supplier um, in 2015 or I don't know. Um, but what I do think is that the agency, um, if they're going to say that we are uh, making a difference in, you know, in moving these guys towards a cleaner, you know, business model, uh, it's one thing to be buying little bits of power from them. I, I mean, I, you know, I have to like some of the people that are working for Shell um, and some of the power that they got for us. I've got no problems with it at all. But if we want to say that we can have an impact on them while we are working with them, I think we need to make some public statements about this drilling in the Arctic business. And I think that if MEA started taking a you know a more politically um, uh, decisive stand in relation to what Shell is doing. And may you know potentially even make some announcement that you know we're happy with the services that they have provided us, but we you know feel like we are going to need to look around for other options. Um, that you know the, the, the think about what could seriously have an impact on Shell, and to work together with our other um, CCA alliance folks around the state. Uh, to get that kind of a statement, like we, you know, I'm sure a lot of them would be glad to have the kind of deal that we're in had, but maybe they won't, you know, be so anxious to, you know, to sign that contract unless there's, um, you know, shall make some, you know, some move. This would at least protect us from some of the people who say, oh, well, you're just in bed with Shell, because, you know, I mean, it's like. On the one hand, we have this terrific image, but for this reason and then another reason which I won't go into, we have had a you know a really bad time in the you know 
progressive community and, and even in the CCA movement in the Bay Area, I mean, people just don't appreciate what Marin Energy um, has done, partly because they are able to point at Shell and, uh, and make that, um, you know, kind of erase all of the benefits <coughs> that, that we've produced. Thank you, Barbara. Um, sure. Just on the same topic, I have no comment on <coughs> Shell's, you know, political bents, and I would agree on the Arctic drilling. I guess what I would encourage now doing what I do across the country related to CCA is to just keep in mind that, that you are running a business first. And yes, there is absolutely need to, to be aware of sort of the political fallout and where you do business, but what's interesting about Shell is that you've got um, communities in the Midwest who are wanting Shell to come in to that marketplace because they have one of the, the, the cleanest underlying supply of any of the big five suppliers. So I'm not defending Shell or what it, MEA wants to do with it, but I think one of the things, the criteria that you all should be looking at, should you decide to go back out in the marketplace and look at other full requirement bidders is what is their underlying power supply? What's the fleet? What do they own? Do they own a ton of coal? Do they own a lot of natural gas? Do they own, is it mostly nuclear? I mean, those actually, there is a very direct nexus to what MEA espouses. So I think you have to keep that in mind as well as all of the other past transgressions. And it is, I mean, we are in the land of butterflies out here compared to the rest of the country. Um, and so it's unfortunate that Shell doesn't have another name for what it's doing in this space, because I think it actually is probably one of the best in this space. Uh, um, closely related to what Sean was talking about, there's also this issue that says, I mean, when, when we, I remember when the Shell contract first came up and several people on the board said, ooh, and then, I forget who it was, but somebody said, well, it's an energy company. The ick factor is pretty high with all of them. There is no such thing as this squeaky clean, wonderful energy company that doesn't exist. And if we start to say that the relative politics, the relative badness on issues that don't directly impact this business is better or worse with one versus the other, we're suddenly into a game where that's a criteria for how we let a contract and the debate will never end. Is what Shell's doing in the Arctic worse than what, um, I forget which company, is taking the tops off all these mountains in West Virginia and dumping them down in the valleys? Or uh, is corrupting people in Congress to support coal? I mean, there are evils at every one of these, and we could get a classic Marin County circular debate going on which ones, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of this particular pin, and the you know, meanwhile, we are, are losing sight of, okay, who among all these bad guys is best suited to supply our needs? You know, we all buy gasoline from people. There's nobody good in that business either, but, we, you know, who's going to run my car? Uh, I think it's, it's really critical because you slide, slide over the edge of that slippery slope, and all of a sudden this place has turned into a, a branch of some, uh, you know, social justice debating committee. Uh, and we got a company to run here. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of a phrase called the sins of my father. Um, it seems to me that going forward, uh, we're looking at 2016, which is really a blink of an eye. Uh, and where do we go from here to there? And where do we go from 16 forward? And what do we look to? Do we look to, my view has been since day one when I came onto this board, is we were talking about, gee, we're going to have our own, our own assets. People said, well, you're crazy. You can't do that just to start a new business. And they were right about that. But we, I think we ought to be looking at, you know, how do we turn this thing into something that we do own? And that becomes energy independence. If in 10 or 15 years, this agency owns its own equipment or is a partner with, with somebody else that, uh, that, that makes it, and we don't have to have, you know, 150 employees. And so we get to the church in that way. And, and what's happened before, we can't fix. That was yesterday. We can't fix it now. Perfect segue, if I ever heard of one. Uh, why don't we talk about local uh, initiatives, speed and tariff, energy efficiency, own versus other options in terms of assets? That'd be great. 
Um, so yeah, we're, we're really excited about the new EE programs that are going to get started, and I know we wanted to talk a little bit about the, the feed-in tariff program as well. Um, since we have a couple of folks here to give presentations, we may want to start with EE and do feed-in tariff. Is that all right with you, Kirby? Go ahead. Okay. Um, and so it's that, Damon, is that what you had in mind that we hear from our EE folks? I'm going to actually leave the, the, the structure to you guys. I think you have the general. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I think it would be helpful to hear from our EE partners, um, and because we kind of we've added some things to the to the plate here as far as what we want to talk about, um, if we could ask our EE presenters to be really succinct in outlining the program, I think we'll have some time later to um, get into more of the details. But I think it'd be helpful at this point for the board to get a sense of some of the nuts and bolts of the EE work that we plan to do, um, and then we'll talk about the feed-in tariff and. Really, the purpose of these two areas is really to start to move our agency um, towards more local generation uh, and um, to reduce the demand in, in our jurisdiction so that we're procuring a little less each year as we go forward. So um, if we could start with, um, do you all have the EE presentations ready? I think we're going to start with the Marin City CDC. Of course. <coughs> So the first representative we're going to hear from today is Makini Hassan, who is the director of the Marin City Community Development Corporation, and she's been working with us, um, gosh, for about a, a year or so on an informal basis to help us think through how we want our energy efficiency program to look here in Moran. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the work that they do, and then also um, can answer any questions that you all might have. We're in the process of putting together a scope of work and a contract so that, so that uh, we have a, a formal working relationship, and we're really excited about what they are bringing to the table here. So welcome, Makini. Thanks so much for making the trip up here. And thank you. Thank you, Dawn and NEA, uh, for the invitation. I've always been dry mouth, so I just want to prepare in advance. Um, so I'm going to go through these pretty edit pretty quick. Um, clip. All right. Who's the person that's? Who the person that is? Okay. So I'll let you know, but I'm going to really kind of go through these. Uh, I had some additional slides because I wanted folks to have a sense of what our agency does and who we are and what we're engaged in currently as well as what we're doing um, with this project. Uh, I think the first slide, um, I just wanted to say that one of the things about our agency that's very key is that we're a workforce intermediary, which means and is recognized in the industry as an organization that has a dual customer approach. So we're dedicated and work very hard to provide comprehensive services to the business community and also comprehensive services and preparation that supports job seekers or those that are trying to skill up and get, get good jobs. Uh, this gives you an overview of, you know, of our agencies uh, since its uh, beginning in 1979. Um, we, uh, if you look at our staff, because of the services we provide to both businesses uh, throughout the county, our payroll uh, uh, fluctuates from the average of 20 to 30 work experience trainees to the max we've ever had was 170. So we built the capacity to handle all the back office that includes workman's comp and payroll and everything to support businesses and allow folks to get some training opportunities and real jobs. Next please. Uh, our memberships in, uh, in order uh, to focus on demand occupations and growth or emerging industries, we know we have to be on the ground in understanding the needs of businesses. So our memberships with uh, organizations, both locally, regionally, and nationally, allow us to have a full understanding of what the workforce needs are for companies. Uh, our workforce intermediary model and mission for services is, as mentioned here, uh, providing quality service to uh, residents, businesses, and stakeholders. 
Uh, we consider ourselves, while we're a 5013C, we consider ourselves a hybrid because we have a earned income business model and so as well as measurable social impact. So while we're looking at a business model that has to be, you know, have, has to provide sustainability for our agency, we're also clear that we have to have measurable social impact. So those are the two areas that we're responsible for um, performing on. Thank you. Uh, this is an example of the work we do around uh, economic uh, security. And our economic security is our core mission uh, to low income residents. Uh, in doing that, we uh, have asset building, small business support and services and partnerships. TAM Adult School uh, provides services at our site that increases academic preparation and credentials. And this is an example of our industry-led certifications and training. We don't do training separate from the, the uh, unions or businesses. We want to make sure people are getting the skills and the training that really are marketable and in demand. Uh, one of the projects we felt really great about uh, recently was a contract with the Marin Housing Authority to actually train the residents in construction skills. And we can say that 90% of the graduates moved into regular positions, uh, apprenticeship programs, or are regular workers on our projects. And some of the highlights are those that have not only entered apprenticeships, but those that have been hired by local construction, energy, uh, and other related companies uh, in this particular area. Um, and there's ongoing support for these graduates. They don't graduate and get placed in a job and that's it. We work with them for a long period of time to make sure they're moving into careers and you know, experiencing economic uh, security. We also provide very comprehensive business services. Uh, and this supports their need for skilled workers and helps them focus on what they do as a business and not having to deal with some of the other issues that uh, can impact, impact a company. And so many companies even screen and hire applicants at our site. And we've been very successful in getting people connected to jobs that way. Uh, we are also a uh, HUD registered Section 3 concern, which means we ensure that government funded projects have as a priority to hire local residents and provide prevailing wages. So we do this for government entities here in Marin, and one of our largest um, uh, projects happens, happens to be those that are doing work for the Marin Housing Authority, those contractors. Uh, we do all the certifications they need, the federal, federal payroll certifications, and we also utilize our database of over 800 to work with uh, and work with the Marin Employment Connection to identify qualified candidates. Them. These are a list of our current projects. Um, our, our business side ensures that we're very dynamic and responsive to opportunities that will, you know, support companies as well as provide work and work experience opportunities. So under our higher smart staffing solutions, what makes our, our staffing solutions different from the traditional staffing solutions is we don't uh, charge a fee for a hire. So uh, other companies, they like somebody, they want to keep bring them regular, they've got to pay a fee. That's the mission of the agency. So if you don't charge that fee, people are able to very successfully transition from that. The most um, recent project that we're really very happy about is one uh, that both MEA and um, our uh, Catherine Sears, our uh, supervisor, uh, recommended us for, and that was staffing the project that's uh, doing commercial installation at the airport, solar installation. So we were able to identify engineers and solar commercial solar installers for that project and feedback we've gotten is it's going very well. Uh, we have other companies that we provide the support to. We're currently working with a Sausalito Marin City Sanitation District to do community outreach, construction re remediation and cleanup and painting. And then the Housing Authority, we have Traditionally, many, many contracts with them. We do unit turnovers, weatherization, retrofits, hardscape maintenance of their properties. And then, of course, we're providing to a number of major construction companies the Section 3 concern and support. Uh, these are the partners. We realize that you know our work has to involve and include collaborative partners. So not only are we partnering with business associations and companies, but we're also partnering with other key organizations in the county that provide aligned services. 
So these are the company, you know, organizations that we're part of. I do sit on the Workforce Investment Board and co-chair of the Construction and Energy Committee, along with Bill Scott. But all these partners are really key in the services that we provide. Uh, so this project, again, we're very, very uh, excited to be part of this and to be asked to uh, partner uh, with MEA. And basically, we're starting out providing services to local residents and businesses by doing outreach and marketing of the services of MEA. And this is important because one of the things we found was that in low-income communities throughout the state, uh, they, those communities have the lowest participation in, ener in energy efficiency programs that would, of course, reduce energy, but also reduce the cost in their household. So it's a really important piece that we are looking forward to being able to communicate to Marin City and the Canal and other low-income communities in particular so they can participate in these programs. And then there's always connected to this an environmental awareness, really understanding what impact does this have even beyond reducing your cost and your usage? What does this do to the environment? How you know, we all as citizens have an opportunity to contribute to that. Uh, and so our outcomes with that project is meeting resident and business participation goals and increased energy savings for underrepresented communities. Thank you. Now, uh, the workforce project, which is coming later, is something we're also very excited about because it, it, it has an economic development uh, component to this, uh, the energy efficiency piece. Uh, as we engage community residents in the programs that reduce energy usage and reduce costs, we also have the opportunity to increase the number of local residents who are trained as raters or other energy efficiency uh, workers that increases skills and creates jobs. Uh, and at the same time, we have the chance, we know a number of local contractors that provide these services that we work with all the time, and we have the chance to hopefully support the increase of work for these local contractors, which again, if they have more work, they can build their business and they can hire more, more local folks. And then, of course, the environmental impact that we want to contribute to and support uh, MEA's uh, goals in terms of that. Uh, last, I just want to say, as a workforce intermediary with a very successful track record, we're ready to ensure that local hire requirements are met, that local contractors have the opportunity with our support to increase business and create uh, additional jobs, while the very important piece of this is supporting MEA's uh, energy efficiency goals on the project. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions? I have a question. Yes. All right. Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I'll I'll show you seat, I keep forgetting. <laughs> you know, the peanut <laughs> is that all right? Thank you. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, Don, the work that the CDC is doing, how is that related to the multifamily um, work that was just approved through the PUC Energy Efficiency Fund? It, it would absolutely be part of that work. And there are two roles that um, the CDC would play. The first would be community outreach, um, which um, they um, have the ability to do on a lot of different levels. And then the other is um, recruitment of, uh, of workforce. So. Um, just to kind of walk you through it, if, if we go into a multifamily building and meet with the property owner and find an interested property owner, um, we would conduct an audit and then we would need um, workforce to, to, uh, to handle the retrofit piece of it. So depending on what's engaged in the retrofit itself, there could be plumbing, electrical, it could be uh, simple, um, simple or complex, but we'd be working with the CBC to help identify workers that um, fit into the areas that are needed for the contracting. Um, that was a great presentation. I was just curious, how does the CDC train the, the workers that are going to do the energy efficiency? Is there classes? Or are they apprenticed to existing contractors? How does it work? Very good question. We always Second work question. with the industry <laughs> itself. Yeah. And so there are classroom-based classes that, again, are led by uh, representatives from um, exactly could be IBEW, Local Electrici Electricians Union. Uh, we have others that are contractors that also provide training on site. I didn't mention that we have a four and a half acre estate in Marin City uh, that we operate out of, and that has provided the room and you know all that good, you know the, the uh, space to actually do that kind of training. And then we connect people very quickly 
through the work experience projects that I outlined to actual experience. So while we understand the classroom-based training and also working with the community college and working with the adult school are important, folks really learn how to do this work well by having on-the-job training. And so the work experience component that we uh, address in many ways allows folks to get that experience. And what we found is people kind of move from work experience and that training into actual opportunities. Uh, so that's how the training will be done. We already have a good group of folks that have been trained already that are very interested in this work and we continue to engage them in number, a number of projects uh, and build that workforce of available people that can, you know, uh, participate. Just a couple of follow-up questions. Thank you. So on the San Rafael Airport project with Synapse Electric, is CDC providing a significant number of workers for that project? Uh, we did, I, I would say we had about a half a dozen workers for the project. It wasn't as large, we thought it would be a huge project, uh, but it only took based on the way that Synapse does that work and the way you do commercial uh, installations. It didn't take as many workers as, as we had uh, anticipated, uh, but it's been very successful. They're bringing on some of the folks that have been part of that project with us onto the regular workforce and going to be including them in future projects and we hope to work with them on other projects where they can utilize, you know, workers for. Great, thank you. I just did. I just okay. touched it. Can I make a follow up, David? Go for it. This story needs to be told because, uh, and I'm sure that Don gets this call regularly, but what's currently happening around the state is that you have the I IBEW and other groups basically poo pooing CCA out of hand as saying it's a jobs killer <coughs> and it's an economic development, you know, killer. And what we see right here is on the ground proof that at least so far in San Rafael it's working, this is a program that's working, so it would be great if we could maybe connect some dots um, to begin to get this particular story out because otherwise it's really hurting future CCAs as the IBEW continues to go in and say that, that we're taking away instead of uh, creating jobs. So The other thing that I think is important to also be aware of, and Marin in particular, uh, most of the contractors may or may not be. I mean, the relationship with the unions vary. And one of the unique things about this county is we have a number of businesses that um, were doing this work way before it became the, you know, the thing to do and all that kind of stuff. We have companies that have 30 and 40 years experience doing this work or small businesses. So what we found in terms of looking at where the jobs are was you know being part of the associations like you know um, uh, Calcia, where hundreds of or, and Marin Builders Association, where hundreds of contractors have small businesses could use additional support, see you know work opportunities where they're not able to bring on someone long term, but they want to make a, take advantage of an opportunity that might end up providing growth. That's really what the reality is in this county as opposed to having hundreds and hundreds of union jobs. While that's important and we support it, we're also looking at where the jobs are and where the opportunities are for economic development. Good point, Sean. Thanks, McKinney. Um, Don, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Sure. Um, so next we're going to hear from AEA, um, who's coming to us from the East Bay, um, who's been patiently waiting. Um, thank you very much for waiting. Um, and we're very excited about the role that AEA is, is um, uh, offering to play in our EE program. They have a lot of experience with the multifamily sector, more from a technical angle. So, so the role that they would be playing would be more related to helping with the audit process, um, helping to manage the retrofit process and make sure that it's um, conducted uh, in the best way that it should, and also helping with some of the uh, benchmarking and measurements of success to, to ensure that we're um, complying with our goals and, and achieving our goals. So um, I'll turn it over to you to uh, give the overview. Do we have copies of Do we have copies No, I'm very excited. Yeah. Uh, out. Sorry. Sorry, this is just a visual presentation, but we'll be posting it on our website so folks can access it after the fact. Sorry about that. I just want to first start off by thanking Don for uh, inviting me to come here and tell you a little bit about my organization, the one that I work for. Um, the Association for Energy Affordability, we're a not-for-profit uh, technical services and training organization. 
that has specialized um, very specifically in energy efficiency and multifamily buildings for the last 20 years. Um, and we have, we're a New York based company. Uh, we've got about 130 people back east. Um, combination of energy engineers, project managers, building scientists, trainers, and technical consultants. Um, back east we have, um, training is a very big part of what we do. We have two very large training centers with labs, uh, technical labs with live fire boilers and um, cooling equipment, HVAC equipment, uh, controls, uh, where we do a lot of education, uh, but we also do a lot of implementation. Um, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Uh, out here, we're, uh, we're a smaller office based in Emeryville. Um, so, actually, can you go back one for a second? Um, yeah, that's fine. Do, our clients include a, a wide variety of folks, mainly utilities, um, local housing agencies, uh, federal, state, and, and local housing. Um, you can go ahead. So uh, right now we're involved in uh, a bunch of national multifamily related uh, projects. Um, we are currently the market leads for the Department of Energy and NREL's uh, collaborative effort of developing standard work specifications for retrofits in multifamily housing. Um, this is an effort that's been going on for the last year and a half, and it's uh, a large one that's getting ready to go out for public comment. Um, at the end of this year. And these are specifications, these are standard specifications for how you install um, and how you actually implement retrofit work for contractors in multifamily housing. Uh, we're also currently the chair for the working group charged with developing the multifamily energy auditor standards uh, for the Building Performance Institute. Um, and that is also one that's been going on for about the last year. There's a lot going on at the national level right now um, around multifamily energy efficiency because it's, it's a Part, uh, it's, a, it's a part of the market that's been largely ignored for, for many years. Um, kind of falls through the cracks somewhere between single family home and commercial. Um, so single family home programs typically haven't been able to deal with multifamily and commercial programs haven't been able to deal with multifamily. So for many years it's kind of lived in this another world. And now with the, uh, primarily with the effort of the Department of Energy, it's getting a lot more attention. Um, we're also lead members of the development of a multifamily energy audit guideline standard that will be used nationally for the weatherization systems program network uh, that Oak Ridge is uh, in charge of, but we're the prime contributors for it. Um, and we are the manager of the Multifamily Buildings Energy Efficiency Conference Series, which has been going on for about the last, uh, I think there have been seven of them, and the next one is in San Diego uh, next year. Um, so we, we kind of come at multifamily energy efficiency from a variety of ways, but we are primarily on the technical side of things, but also very much on the program implementation side of things. So in New York, um, we are the, technical, the training and technical services um, contractor for the, uh, for the weatherization assistance program uh, in New York City, which means that we basically provide all of the energy audits um, for all of the buildings that are going through that program. There are 18 local agencies that bring buildings through the program. We provide the energy audits for those buildings. Um, and we also write specifications for the installation of uh, new HVAC equipment, large boiler plants, uh, these types of things. Uh, and then we also provide uh, construction oversight, construction management, and post inspection verifications. Um, and that's, that program is really where AEA got its start uh, about 20 years ago. Um, it's nationally, it's very much a single family homes program, but in New York, where people actually live in multifamily buildings, it's always been a multifamily program, and it's um, actually always been a whole building program, which means that it addresses not just uh, the obvious energy efficiency measures, but also uh, operational measures, operational issues, and health and safety issues. Um, we are also work very closely with NYSERDA, we're a performance, uh, multifamily performance program partner, um, and that is a program that's been kind of heralded as the gold star program nationally. A lot of uh, programs across the country are, are looking to that program as the standard and, and using it as a framework to develop their own programs. And we've been uh, bringing buildings through that program ever since its inception. Uh, right now we are the uh, program implementation contractor for a $30 million uh, energy efficiency, multifamily energy efficiency program for Con Edison. Um, and that is a direct install program. Um, and we, we actually do everything from intake all the way through um, close out of all of those properties. And uh, I just found out yesterday that we've actually retrofitted 2,700 buildings in the last two years, a little over two years, uh, under that program. Um, NYSERDA, we were also an implementation contractor for another one of their direct install programs in New York City. 
And uh, prior to that, we were running National Grid, uh, their low-income gas efficiency program. Essentially, we've, uh, we've always run a program either for a NYSERDA or a utility in New York for the last, uh, since, since 1993. And we do that side by side with our work in the Weatherization Assistance Program. So we're in this kind of unique position to be able to leverage funds from multiple sources um, to bring a larger pot of money to every building project that we're involved in. Um, and that really allows us to implement much broader scopes of work uh, and much deeper retrofits on each building. Uh, in California, we've mostly been involved, as soon as we got out here, I moved out here about two years ago, uh, we got plugged into the weatherization network here uh, and started doing consulting work for the, for the state's technical services and training provider here. And also, we began building, uh, bringing buildings through their program. We've done many projects under weatherization. Uh, we're currently bringing a lot of work, um, doing a lot of projects under the tax credit allocation committee's uh, tax credit program that has a very robust sustainable buildings, uh, sustainable building portion. Uh, so these are buildings that are going through deep rehabs, um, and in order to get more points towards their tax credit application, uh, the, the, basically the greater they build, the more points they get. And we're the technical consultants that help them um, on the energy audit side, commissioning and retro commissioning side, uh, and the green building consulting side. Um, we also have done work under a variety of other programs in California that, are, that have either come and gone or are still in existence right now. I won't go through all of them. Uh, and like I said, training is a big part of what we do. So we are uh, we were one of the first two EPI training affiliates in the country many years ago, uh, Building Performance Institute. And the trainings that we uh, have focused on out in California are the multifamily building analyst, the multifamily energy efficient building operator, and uh, actually the hydronic heating system specialist is really something that we do more of in New York. Um, these other programs, these are just some examples of some other training that we do. We have a whole host of training. Um, opportunities. Uh, one of the ones, this clean boilers one, is a, a contractor training that for uh, all properties that go through the weatherization assistance program, um, all of the, the heating contractors that go through that program have to be clean boiler certified, which means that they're familiar with the specifications that we develop, um, they understand how to implement them, they understand how to install these systems in the most efficient way possible. Um, and we've been running that for, for uh, about 15 years. Um, technical services, uh, just kind of a more detailed explanation of what that really means. Um, typically, the type of uh, there, there are three kind of levels of commercial energy audits. There's ASHRAE level one, two, and three. Um, those are kind of broad classifications of, of, of audits. And the ASHRAE level one, as you might presume, is, is a kind of a quick um, walkthrough audit. Uh, a very preliminary <coughs> survey uh, may tell uh, a building owner, eh, you might want to do this, you might want to do that, these are good ideas, they will save you energy, but we can't tell you exactly how much they're going to save you. A level two is a much more detailed um, investment grade audit, which involves building simulations or energy modeling, where you can get a, a much more accurate representation of how much energy they'll actually be saving from the various retrofits that you're recommending. Um, and then a level three audit, which is a highly instrumented audit that takes place over a number of years, and is typically done more in, in larger commercial and industrial facilities. Level, Most of level one is done in residential. Level one is done in all types of facilities, uh, from from residential to industrial, uh, as is level as is level two. Um, and most of what we do and most of what we've been doing in California are level two investment grade okay. audits. And that's pretty much what it's comprised of. The, the, you, you go out, you perform a, a site assessment. Um, you do, actually even prior to that, you do a utility bill analysis um, and benchmarking to get a general idea of, of where your building stands uh, relative to other buildings that are similar. Um, and then uh, once you've come back and you've collected all your data from the building, uh, you conduct an energy model and that helps you develop the scope of work. Um, and then typically we are in charge of negotiating with the owner in terms of here's the list of measures we think you should install, here are the paybacks and this is, this is the cost, this is the savings, um, and they have to, and they are decide what, which, which of those measures they're going to do. In some cases programs may dictate that certain measures they have to do, they may have to do measures with higher paybacks before they can do those with longer term paybacks. Um, then we'll develop uh, performance-based installation specifications, which can be um, kind of lower level, uh, basic specifications that say your system must perform to this criteria, or it could be very level, uh, very uh, very specific detailed specifications that involve piping diagrams and duct runs and that type of thing. Um, 
We'll typically manage the bid process. So once we put the bids together, we bring them up, we take them out to bid with the contractors. We evaluate the bids when they come back and help, um, in this case, it would be MEA, um, vet those contractors and vet those bids. Um, construction oversight, that's kind of a critical uh, role that, has, that we found when we moved out here was kind of a missing piece in the retrofits that we were seeing being done. Um, we're really there on site pretty regularly to ensure that the, that the measures are being installed properly. Uh, and then quality assurance and verification, which comes after the installation to verify that it was properly installed. Uh, other services we provide are commissioning and retro commissioning and some green building um, services lead and green point rating verification. Question, how does your company, do you get a fee for these services or how does it work for you guys? Uh, it's, it's kind of all over the map. Typically, historically, we, uh, like with the weatherization program, we have one large contract um, that carries us from year to year. Um, to, and, and under that contract, we perform all these services for those agencies. Um, but when we're dealing directly with the building owner, yeah, it's a it's a one-on-one -on -one contract. We do a direct fee, so fee for service. Um, in terms of our partnership with MEA, we're very excited about this potential. Uh, to work with you guys. And uh, the, what we really see uh, and what we've discussed our role being would be, again, more on the technical services side. Um, we, would, we would first help to develop a, a very um, specific implementation plan uh, and determine exactly what role we will be playing, what role others will be playing, and how we all work together. Um, and then uh, we would work on the data analysis and benchmarking. So as the portfolio of buildings comes into MEA, we would help evaluate that portfolio and decide which are the, the best opportunities for us to target, um, essentially based on energy use. Um, and then perform those assessments and help develop the scopes of work for each of those projects. Um, we would develop that we would uh, give the savings projections, uh, help with specifications where it's required, um, it sounds like our role is really more on the, going to be more involved on the more complex systems or the, the kind of the common area systems versus the in-unit systems. Um, and we would focus mainly on those central systems that require higher level specifications. Um, we would work with uh, MEA's contractor network and help building owners to implement that scope of work. So basically, do, a lot of what we do is handhold building owners as they're going through the process. A lot of them are unfamiliar with the retrofit process. Um, and we've been through many times, so we can help guide them through it. Um, and then ultimately, data collection and management for the EMV process at the end. So, on this scope of services where you're trying to partner with MEA, are you looking for an agreement then with MEA where you get paid a fee for managing the energy efficiency program for multifamily? Is that the idea? Well, we actually haven't really worked yeah, out the details. We're in the process but... of developing a scope of work um, based on what you see before you hear. Um, and we expect to have that in place in the, within the next week or so. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. Great. And uh, last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from Planet Ecosystems. She's going to talk about the uh, development of a uh, Hi, thanks Rory for being here. I'm going to talk about the development of some really great tools that are going to be applicable to all energy customers, but are particularly designed for a single family residential. Uh, so we're going to hear a bit about what they have to offer and how it will be used by customers. Yeah. Not just single family, but multiple. Yeah, we're, we're uh, going to get some new stuff up and available to multifamily users as well, which is really exciting. Um, while they're getting it ready, I'll say a couple things just by way of introduction. This program has been up and running on a pilot basis in Sonoma County as part of their um, Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, um, relates to their PACE program, and um, it's been pretty successful there. I, I think that one of the, the neat things about this application is that you can reach a lot of customers um, at a pretty low cost. Once you get the, the programs up and running, you, you need to spend time engaging customers, but then it can uh, become a little bit viral, which is exciting, and, uh, and, and we really like the, the format here. I think that it's um, 
really a, a cutting edge concept that both gets at the behavior change, but also gets at some of the, the social media and web engage, engagement tools that are available now. So um, Roy, Rory is with us from Planet Ecosystems. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, thank you. So uh, my name is Rory Jones, I'm with Planet Ecosystems. We're basically looking here at uh, putting up a, a website tool capability with all sorts of functionality that allows, um, as Dawn was just pointing out, they allows uh, the use of social tools and that kind of thing to, to get consumers to act. We think of ourselves as demand reduction service providers, right? We see ourselves as putting in front of you some tools that will help you persuade consumers to do something. Right? Since the 70s, we haven't really been able to persuade them to do much. <laughs> this is what we're doing. Behavior right. modification. Behavior modification, that's exactly Can you go to the next one? So uh, really what we're going to do uh, in this discussion is to focus more on what's on the right-hand side there, which is tools that help motivate people. It gets, gets them engaged, uh, helps them find a reason to do stuff. Uh, the stuff on the left is more about um, the initial outreach. You need to bring people into a program at one point or another, and that's usually done through media or through some other uh, outreach kind of uh, media kind of campaign. We're not going to talk about that for the moment. We're going to really just focus on, on what the uh, website capabilities are. <coughs> we believe very strongly, however, that there, there is actually a full uh, life cycle that happens, and you need to first get the engagement. Once you've got them brought in, you need to find some reason to get them, to motivate them to take action. And then, on the last slice there, on the right-hand side, where it says action, they need help to get stuff done. So, you know, whether it be simple stuff like getting rebates, and if you ever try to get a rebate off the PG&E website, once you find the form, which is not an easy thing to do, you fill it out, you send it in, and it gets kicked back because it's got some problem with it. So you go through, so the stuff like that is, is really quite painful and, and slows the whole process down. So we'll help with uh, automatic submissions of rebate forms, we'll help you connect you to uh, contractors, if you have approved list of contractors, we can make that work. We can help you find financing, so whether that be PACE or some other program. And to the extent that we're able to, we'll help you complete, because we already have a lot of information about you as a consumer. We'll help you complete forms needed to get the financing, find the financing service provider, wherever it may be. So we believe in looking at the entire life cycle of the, the cell. We think of it very much as a cell program of uh, an outreach. So uh, just by way of uh, letting you know, so how, how do we get people to act? How do we motivate them? Uh, we found that there's basically three or four uh, uh, key motivators that engage, uh, engage folks and actually compel them to take action. Uh, the one on the left there, I don't know you can't read it there. So think of this as uh, the web page. The one on the left there is uh, minimize, um, maximize. My, maximize my savings. Minimize or, wouldn't work. No, in that case, <laughs> So maximize my savings or wealth. What that basically means is, is you're eligible for a lot of savings if only you knew what to do. Right? The house is a pretty confusing place. Should you change your windows? Should you put insulation in? What, what should you do? Change the refrigerator? You don't know what it's worth. We've created a set of tools uh, uh, that are proprietary that allow you to go out and, and that optimize the energy systems in your home, including water, and figure out what the best things are for you to do. And it's usually a list of somewhere between three and ten actions. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So that's, that's maximizing your savings or your wealth. The second one there is minimizing, and that's, you your, got that right for and that's your carbon footprint. So this tool, what it helps you to do is to figure out for the smallest amount of outlay, the smallest spend, how can you get your carbon footprint down to, to the lowest possible, or get you off the grid altogether, get you to net zero. Uh, evaluating a project is um, something that's important, but I'm not going to go into it for the moment. And then the last two uh, on the right there are um, uh, uh, help you improve your uh, the health situation in your home or the comfort situation. That's really appealing to folks who are in the winter shivering and not able to afford turning up their heat. And so uh, each of these really appeals to uh, the broad motivators for various parts of our society. Uh, clearly on the left, if you've got a lot of throughput of energy, there's actually a lot of money at stake. Uh, and on the right, if you're cold and you've got uh, health or comfort issues at home, it'll help you figure, figure out how to get those resolved for the lowest amount of investment, or the lowest spend. 
I'm going to take a quick detour, if that's all right, because I just want to do one thing. Can you hit the end button? Because I, I want to go to the very last slide. End, hit the last end. And th I just want to describe to you how the, how the uh, economics works, and it'll take about 30 seconds to do. If you have a bill that's 5,000 bucks, what this will do is it'll help you figure out what the best initiatives are in the home to get your bill down to some minimum. And it does this by very cleverly looking at the marginal price of gas, and of electricity, and of various other fuels, and water. And it, it, it'll do it in a way that, that figures out between all the different fuels across the expanse of time, across 25 years for solar or five for light bulbs, it will figure out exactly how to get your bills over the long term down to the absolute minimum. When you do this properly, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but this, if this is this year, it saved you two and a half thousand bucks. You think about that over a 10 year process, it's 25,000 bucks. So, you know, we're talking large sums of money here in comparison with what an individual has and what their spend is. This is a PG&E rates based in 2010, 2011. Can we go back to page, whatever it was, I think it might have been four. I have a question. Five. It's based upon, you said, the PGE rates in 2010, the model? 2010. Yes, 2010. So my only concern is, as I hear from our very excellent consultants across the way there, that those rates are pretty variable and move all over the place. So I'm just curious how good the model works with the rates being so variable. Uh, they are variable. They, they do move. and. Uh, I wouldn't actually, at this point, I wouldn't say there's actually not much movement between the messages that you see here at a high level and what the reports were. Thank you. We also began the process about two weeks ago of loading in NEA rates into their model so that um, our customers will be able to see the exact impact of it. Excellent answer. I'm sorry, I should have, uh, that's exactly what I'm Can you do the next slide? So it's worth. It's worth just looking at the market as a whole. Uh, I'm not sure that these are directly applicable to Marin, but I'm sure they're, they're pretty close to it. And what they basically say is 20% of the consumers are consuming 40% of the energy. That means through these homes, there's a lot of throughput of energy, which means they're probably in the upper price brackets, which means the amount of money that's available for them is huge. All right, so this is what this is. Do you remember those four motivators we have? The one on the left is the wealth and savings one. The amount of money we're talking about putting in front of the top 20% of consumer, so these are consumers with bills today of over 300 bucks a month, we're, we're able to tempt them with the cottage fund size uh, reward. If they take somewhere between three to 10 actions that, that this software tool tells them to do. Yeah, and it's done. And so, and so we, we find these appeals for, for each market sector and we think very carefully about who it is that we target and we need to understand what their consumption profile is and what their house is. And we take two minutes over that, over that process, which I think is on the next slide. So this is the input tool. It's the, there are three um, versions of this software that we, that we have and that we make available to you. The first version is, is what we call outbound engagement, which is where we basically uh, send a mailer of some kind to each consumer in each of those three groups. And we say, Here, here's what's in it for you. And the mailer is tailored, tailored for you, and it basically says, you know, for you, Mrs. Swanson, there's 34,746 if you want to take seven actions. If you want to know what the seven actions are, go to the web page that's listed at the bottom here, and we've now got you engaged. Right? You're, you're now thinking, these guys are here to help. And we can also provide, from the past, I don't know, we can also provide other different messages clearly oriented around figuring out what the consumer will respond to and, and finding a message that would drive the highest level. Who did you send this to? Uh, consumers. All of them? No, we had actually target them to figure out yeah. who are the best opportunities. And there are various ways that you can do that by looking at publicly available information and looking at their consumption history. So, question? Yes. Um, have your projections been validated in the field? Uh, yes. Because oh, in, in California, we use a, uh, an energy model uh, that is actually very wrong. Uh, it produces very high projections of energy use. The, the HERS, the software that generates a HERS score uh, projects much higher 
use than for most buildings. Uh, there's one in Oregon called EPS that is actually validated. Uh, is yours validated like that? Yes, and, and I'd love to talk to you about it. In fact, I think you're quite right. The, uh, the, the program that we have here is, is based on your, your personal consumption, not on a theoretical, which is what hers end up. So we put our energy bills in. And so yes, I, I'd be, yeah, exactly. And in fact, we find ways of making that a very easy process to do. And in working with uh, MEA, actually, we can just download that stuff for them, provided they can prove their identity. Yeah, Denise. So, um, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to finish? Well, I was just saying there are three versions of the tool. I spoke about one, which is the outbound engagement. Version two is this thing, which is a two-minute tool. We basically preloaded it inform with information based on your property that we're aware of through Zillow, through various other sources. We know your consumption history. So uh, all you have to do is to go through and change what we've got wrong, you know, like the number of kids that you've got, that kind of thing. And then, and then it'll go, it'll turn around and it'll tell you what your uh, savings opportunity is. And that's tool number two. Tool number three is where we we have an auditor program where you can send a pro in, it's called the Pro Tool, and it does it. It's, it's capable of incorporating all the technical stuff that they that those kind of yeah, lower, lower door tests and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, how many times would you need to send a card to an address in order for them to respond? Because like in my inbox, in my email, I have been gifted millions of dollars from people all over the world who want to put, who want to put money into my bank account. Um, and I pretty much press delete, you know, on every single one of us. So I'm just, I'm just wondering how many times do you need to, you know, send it? What is your return? Well, this is something we'll have to uh, work out with management here. It, it, our belief is you need to hit them up once a month, and this can't be the only channel to reach them. Right. How much does it cost? For the for, for your, as I understood you, your um, software is proprietary, so presumably Absolutely. there there's a cost that associated with using it. Right, and I'll, I'll leave that to Dawn to walk through that material later, rather than take it on myself. You don't know. Outside of my purview. Sorry. You don't know. Uh, oh, I think there is some discussion element going on. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> okay. I figured. But um, yes, yeah, so no it's cost per user, though. If you're asking that, it's no cost to the consumer. So where are we? And so yeah, so this is an output screen. Actually, we're we're up, upgrading it. Uh, and so here here are the for if your user X, here are your eight things. I'm guessing I can't see this close. So it's seven things there. And you know, so uh, light light bulbs often come up. That they're, although they're five years in scope, there's usually uh, 10, 20 percent of the energy consumed. Therefore, since they're so cheap, they tend to come off at the higher marginal prices. Therefore, there's a lot of they're, they're often worth huge amounts. If you were to change the CFLs, if you don't like the color of them, you can actually go into preferences up there and say, I'm not changing my bulbs. And then the program reallocates that expensive reference to, to other stuff. Yeah, I just, I'm just unclear then. So, your service that you're in, and this whole website tool optimizer, this is something that you're suggesting that MEA would acquire as a service available to its customers. Is that exactly. Right? Okay, just so we're clear what we're talking about. I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't, I'm a little slow off the mark. Now, now I get it. Got it, thank you. And in fact, you do. I was just gonna say, it depends on which uh, of, of the three tools, really the consumer tool is the one that's going on the website, together with all the other facilities to make you as a consumer find it easy to do the finding the rebates, getting the contract. The other two tools are more offline. You know, the, the, the campaign tool, this thing is much more of a start function. Let's, let's uh, put an insert in the bill and uh, do it that way, or there are various ways you can do it. And the campaign tool is very much what an auditor will take on a tablet into the house and, and spend half an hour. Is this up and running now? Yes. Well, not on the Marin site, it's not. No, but in California, it's it's available to, you're working with other public so agencies. Yeah, we're working with Sonoma County, we're working with Best Lyle, so. All right, let's do two couple more qu quick questions, then we're going to move on to feed and tear because we only have about forty-five more minutes. I think that I think that the, the question that you're trying to get at, Len, is where does this get? Who pays for this? 
yeah. and it's if it's not costing, if it's not an add-on on the bill to our ratepayers, is is MEA paying for it? And I think this is coming out of EE funding through the PUC that yes. that, that everyone pays, all the customers pay into. This is funding that comes back. I believe I could be wrong about this. It yes. goes back to yes. MEA for energy efficiency projects. But MEA would still have to choose whether or not this is part of their. Right. Program. Yes. Exactly. Of course, yes. Right. But this is another example of whether we contract something out or whether we do it ourselves. We don't really have the capability to do that ourselves. And the question is, is it our policy and programming goal in order to uh, do it, compel, not compel, to, to treat the customers to do energy efficiency? This is a way to educate them is how to do it. We can't do it in house at this point in time. So. It's a question of whether or not this is cost effective for us to buy as a, as a program. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a fair point. One last. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention to build on what Roy was saying. In terms of outbound engagement, the vast majority of consumers have no idea how much money is on the table. So by actually going and uh, engaging them outbound and saying, look, there's a sizable amount of money here, it actually will bring them into the program. We spent all of 2009 actually going into hundreds of homes in Sonoma County. And when you sat down with homeowners and showed them kind of the path to reducing their bills as much as possible, they were often stunned and couldn't believe how much money was on the table. And oftentimes we were sitting there showing them a path to reducing their consumption by 70 to 80 percent. So really consumers are completely tuned out about the issue and they need some sort of outbound engagement and awareness. And the second thing I'd say is when you actually come in and you uh, create a plan, in the market, the market is kind of bifurcated between efficiency people over here, there's some behavioral stuff here, and solar. What this solution does is it actually brings it into one place. So it's making the trade-offs between efficiency, solar, and behavioral to minimize the amount of consumption there. And importantly, it's actually bringing solar into the process because the efficiency tools that are in the market really ignore solar completely. And what Rory didn't show is at the end of this is that uh, when he was talking about those three different segments, solar is a huge part of the mix here. It can help in terms of uh, reducing consumption in Marin County in a very profound way. So really this tool uh, will enable consumers to figure out what's the path to really reducing my consumption as much as possible. Okay, great, thank you, you guys. Thank you. Sorry, no, Steve, no. that's Steve Maloney. I yeah, figured sorry. Yeah. No, I don't yeah. so, or else he was just a really good <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I can speak for two, two more minutes. Yeah. One Let's more minute. make it 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Two minutes is good. Go back one slide, please. What we didn't show was I. Uh, Basically, the solution is a one-stop shop. So it does have everything there to help a consumer take action. So it will show them all the applicable rebates, the financing. It will show them how to find contractors. And one of the things we found is that the important point in the decision-making process is once you get a plan, if it's not easy to act on, they actually don't uh, achieve the reductions that are on the table. So really, the goal here is to show them that there's a huge amount of money on the table, or there's an opportunity to reduce your carbon footprint in a huge way. And here's the path to actually getting it done. And it's important to connect both of those as well as have social tools on the back end to try to engage people's friends, their neighbors, their uh, fellow uh, people of corporations as well. So, All thank right, you. great. Thank you. Let's uh, move into feed in there. Okay, fantastic. In, in the interest of time, and I know we're running out of that. We're I, past I, that. I, yeah, I, I want to leave a little bit of an opportunity for, for wrap up and discussion at the end and so yeah, I'll move pretty quickly so slow me down and let's again we want to tie it back into the resource planning discussion absolutely in total we have about 40 minutes okay well hopefully I'll take up like 15 minutes of that um, so anyway as you mentioned uh, early on in the day uh, Economy. A lot of this information has been communicated in various forums and forums to date uh, within the technical committee meetings, uh, within board meetings, and certainly at the staff level we've kicked around uh, the idea of a feed-in tariff and of course now that we have that program in place, uh, this seems like an appropriate time to fold it into a broader based discussion focused on integrated resource planning. Uh, won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but the, the, the gist of the, the this particular slide here is simply that uh, your board approved the feed-in tariff in December of 2010. It was implemented in January 2011, and since then, we've basically put one megawatt of our two megawatt cap under contract. 
one of the things to underscore related to feed-in tariffs is that developing projects in Marin, as you are all keenly aware, presents its set of challenges. And you can see here that as of August 1st, uh, according to PG&E, they have only executed one feed-in tariff agreement within Marin County for a total of 80 kilowatts. So not a lot is being done here. Uh, we'll get into the reason why that may be the case uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So as far as the purpose of the feed-in tariff, uh, I think one of the things to, to just highlight here, two of the things, really the express purpose is to create an opportunity for locally situated, small-scale renewable energy developers to engage in wholesale transactions with MEA and to do that on as simplistic basis as is humanly possible and all with the interest uh, of increasing renewable energy supply, promoting resource localization, reducing reliance on fossil fuels, and of course with that, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and then also promoting uh, local, uh, excuse me, economic benefits as well. So, John mentioned in his presentation, focused on integrated resource planning, that uh, Standard offer contracts are kind of an important piece of the procurement process. The feed-in tariff is one example of a standard offer contract where we put out an agreement which is which is virtually non-modifiable by the counterparty, and we expect that if they're going to transact with us, they, they take that agreement um, without modification. So, you can go to the next slide. This is just a brief overview of the current program. Uh, this program, as I previously mentioned, was designed as a, as a pilot program. Uh, when we initially launched and were serving approximately 14,000 customers, it made sense to launch the feed-in tariff as a relatively small program. Two megawatt cap, one megawatt project-specific limit, and, uh, and then various other terms that were folded in. Now that the agency's grown and looks to expand into adjacent communities in the very near future, uh, really the time has come now to think about how it is that we grow that program as we move into the future. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. We've talked about this in the past uh, in, in various places, and, and this simply illustrates that there are a number of different resource types that are out there uh, to consider, and those resource types tend to deliver energy in various different ways. And what that means uh, is that the value of that energy changes as well. So the time at which you receive that energy, the production profile of the generator, uh, really influences the price that the buyer is willing to pay. MEA is no different in that regard. So that's kind of a segue here to, to the pricing discussion. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do when we created a feed-in tariff was really uh, hone in on the most simplistic pricing structure possible and also the clearest pricing structure possible. And so we initially launched this program with a pricing structure that was, was really uh, benchmarked off of our contract price that we paid to our largest energy supplier, Shell Energy North America, offering in order to attract those local developers. Just a couple of uh, differences to call out here as far as pricing is concerned for MEA's feed-in tariff and PG&E's feed-in tariff. I think a couple of these things are, are particularly noteworthy. Uh, one of the key features of our pricing schedule and you can actually go to the, the next slide if you would, and I can talk about uh, something here related to pricing, is that MEA chose to look at three distinct delivery profiles, which are really kind of predominant in the energy space. One of those is a peak energy delivery profile. Energy tends to be delivered kind of right in the middle of the day when you need it most. Another is a base or a base load delivery profile, which typically means that that energy is delivered in a relatively flat pattern over a prolonged period of time. And then the other is more of an intermittent schedule, which is uh, more typically associated with, say, a wind generator, where you literally get the power whenever the wind blows, and you don't necessarily know when that's going to occur. And so what we did is we, we took a, a shot at looking at how the value of that energy from MEA's perspective differed across those various energy delivery profiles and assign these particular values um, using, as I mentioned before, that SENA contract price as the, as the baseline um, for that focus. This is a distinct and, and different from PG&E's 
uh, pricing option. And if you'll go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that. Where there is a base price that's assigned and then time of delivery factors that are used to adjust the way that pricing is paid out um, to developers in consideration when that energy is delivered. So you can see here that based on the time of day in which energy is delivered, for example, right in the middle of summer, right in the middle of the day, you can take that, that base energy price and multiply it by 2.38, and that's the price that pg e is willing to pay you. Now, that may seem like, wow, pg e is willing to spend a lot more money on a feed-in tariff project than we are, but what you also have to look at is the way that uh, energy prices are, are effectively adjusted downward by, by factors less than one at other times of day or in other seasons where the energy may not be as valuable. And what that does, I think, is uh, one of the benefits that, that MEA has built into its feed-in tariff uh, it is a high level of predictability in the modeling efforts that need to go on by these different developers when they project out uh, project economics. Uh, when they can use just a fixed flat price throughout the entirety of the term for all energy that's delivered, which is which is what we do here in MEA, versus something that's a heck of a lot more complicated um, and, and obviously affected quite a bit by seasonality and then time of day. We can go on with this. So this is a, a, an actual example that's based on projected output from the San Rafael Airport's PV facility that is our, our first and currently only um, feed-in tariff project that's under contract. And you can see here that when you impute all of those different time of delivery adjustments to, to pg and &E's base price, over a 20-year term, the airport would receive an average energy price of about $110. With MEA, quite a lot higher. So $133, actually almost $134. And over the, the uh, single year term, that results in over $30,000 difference to the developer. Now, I think at first blush, you could look at that and say, we're really overpaying. And I think that's something that we ought to talk about as we move forward, how we might want to have our pricing structure evolve to reflect market trends. But one of the other things to consider is pg and Union's feed-in tariff is launched on a, on a service territory-wide basis. So this is really kind of Fresno to the northern border of California. And obviously development costs, land costs within that, that service territory. Just a couple of uh, differences to call out here as far as pricing is concerned for MEA's feed-in tariff and PG&E's feed-in tariff. I think a couple of these things are, are particularly noteworthy. Uh, one of the key features of our pricing schedule, and you can actually go to the, the next slide if you would, and I can talk about uh, something here related to pricing, is that MEA chose to look at three distinct delivery profiles, which are really kind of predominant in the energy space. One of those is a peak energy delivery profile. Energy tends to be delivered kind of right in the middle of the day when you need it most. Another is a base or a base load delivery profile, which typically means that that energy is delivered in a relatively flat pattern over a prolonged period of time. And then the other is more of an intermittent schedule, which is uh, more typically associated with, say, a wind generator, where you literally get the power whenever the wind blows and you don't necessarily know when that's going to occur. And so what we did is we, we took a, a shot at looking at how the value of that energy from MEA's perspective differed across those various uh, energy delivery profiles and assigned these particular values um, using, as I mentioned before, that SENA contract price as the, as the baseline um, for that focus. This is a distinct and, and different from PG&E's uh, pricing option, and if you'll go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that, where there is a base price that's assigned and then time of delivery factors that are used to adjust the way that pricing is paid out um, to developers in consideration when that energy is delivered. So you can see here 
that based on the time of day in which energy is delivered, for example, right in the middle of summer, right in the middle of the day, you can take that, that base energy price and multiply it by 2.38, and that's the price that PG&E is willing to pay you. Now, that may seem like, wow, PG&E is willing to spend a lot more money on a feed-in tariff project than we are, but what you also have to look at is the way that uh, energy prices are, are effectively adjusted downward by, by factors less than one at other times of day or in other seasons where the energy may not be as valuable. And what that does, I think, is uh, one of the benefits that, that MEA has built into its feed-in tariff uh, it is a high level of predictability in the modeling efforts that need to go on by these different developers when they project out uh, project economics, uh, when they can use just a fixed flat price throughout the entirety of the term for all energy that's delivered, which is, which is what we do here in MEA, versus something that's a heck of a lot more complicated um, and, and obviously affected quite a bit by seasonality and then time of day. We can go on with this. So this is a, a, an actual example that's based on projected output from the San Rafael Airport's PV facility that is our, our first and currently only um, feed-in tariff project that's under contract. And you can see here that when you impute all of those different time of delivery adjustments to, to PG&E's base price, over a 20-year term, the airport would res receive an average energy price of about $110. With MEA, quite a lot higher, so $133 actually, almost $134. And over the, the uh, single year term, that results in over $30,000 difference to the developer. Now, I think at first blush, you could look at that and say, we're really overpaying. And I think that's something that we ought to talk about as we move forward, how we might wanna have our pricing structure evolve to reflect market trends. But one of the other things to consider is pg and feed-in tariff is launched on a, on a service territory-wide basis. So this is really kind of Fresno to the northern border of California. And obviously development costs, land costs within that, that service territory vary considerably from one location to the next. And so being that we're looking at Marin here in particular, it's important to think about the differentials that exist with respect to development costs in this area versus other areas um, so the developers are attracted here. It didn't work with pg &E. There's only one project, a very small project to date with MEA. In a, in a much shorter period of time, we already have one megawatt under contract and we've, and we've received an application that would have effectively um, take up the remainder of our two megawatt count. So if we can go on to the next slide. Kirby, can I ask you a question? Or, on the back, can we go back to the last slide? This yeah. is undoubtedly a really dumb question, but how, do, how is it that we pay more and also earn more? We pay more and we earn more. Oh, so this is uh, this is the earnings from the developer's perspective. So okay. we're not, yeah. yeah. I thought, wow, this is a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Forget everything else, let's just do this. Yeah. That's that with project. <laughs> We're also looking for investors. So are, are you that, that's to make it look good to us. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, do we, are we able to deliver our energy at our rate with paying that fee in tariff? In other words, that fits under our, our price model? That, that's correct. This is one of the things that's been taken in consideration when developing our rates. Um, we recognize that this is a, a subsidized rate that we're paying to, uh, to developers here with it in mind that over time, we may choose to adjust that rate to move more closely, uh, or move into more close alignment with what we're, what we're seeing in the broader based market. So this, this is really a way to, uh, one, recognize the increased development costs that are really inherent here in Marin, and create an opportunity, an economically viable opportunity for developers within Marin, um, and attract them to do business with, with MEA and then as we move forward in time, and one of the things, questions that I'll really kind of leave you all with today is, how do we want to potentially adjust this pricing schedule going forward so that once we kind of get the ball rolling, so to speak, we can move that price, move that needle downward a little bit um, so that it's more aligned with market, uh, but also high enough where we're still going to attract developers. Thank you.
but this is this is a relatively high price resource for us and so we need to blend this in with yes. other cheaper stuff including non-renewables in order to fit within our rate our rate is yeah is, is about seven uh, this is a dollar so about seventy dollars a megawatt hour on average so obviously we're blending in some lower cost stuff but it's just part of the calculation of the overall rates correct that we charge you yeah. just take that into consideration so, so this is kind of what I, the, the fun spot in the presentation here where we get to talk a little bit about the, the project that's actually underway with the San Rafael Airport. And these are some pictures that were actually taken by Jamie uh, not too long ago when we had an opportunity to go out and visit the construction site here. And uh, it, was, it was pretty neat because that lift truck right there, actually maybe not that lift truck, it was a different one. We got to ride around on it, they lifted this up in the air and Jamie got to take these really cool photos when we were, I don't know how high up in the air, but a little higher than I was comfortable being, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, just to point you here with the, 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 the photos, obviously these are panels. These are the, the PV panels themselves. They're being transported out to the hangar rooftops where they're going to be installed on all of the rack mounting um, that's that's you see here on the roof, and so that's kind of the basis for the installation. We've got a bunch of hangar buildings out there, um, and they're taking these these PV panels, mounting these racks, and then getting those panels up on the building where they'll begin generating power for our customers to the tune of about 1.5 million kilowatt hours a year. Will that not also cool the building inside because you got another layer? You know, that's a good question. We really didn't get into that. Um, Think about it, that sun coming down on, on the middle roof, and that was when you diffused the boat. So. Uh, yeah, we didn't charge for that. It's, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, next slide, please, if you would. Uh, this, this is just another kind of progression. You saw, you saw the, the racks, the rack mounting. Um, here you see some of the, the workers uh, that are out there putting the panels on, and then this is really what the finished product looks like once all of those panels are laid up. And all, you know, all in total, you're talking about just under one megawatt of uh, peak capacity here. And at peak uh, production, that's going to serve about 700 uh, MCD residences. And then this is the really good news is that deliveries are expected to commence like yeah. 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 I'm sorry? Delivery of electricity? Yes, yeah, so that's expected to occur later this month. Or do we have somebody with a big plug and stuff? Celebrate. <laughs> Maybe you. <laughs> so, uh, so if we go to the next slide, this is just kind of a wrap up on the, uh, the airport project. All, all total, 5,000 solar panels, uh, 48 hangar rooftops, and, and really the emphasis here is local, local, local. And that's really the, the whole purpose of the feed in tariffs. Local designer, local builder. We heard about some of the workers uh, that are involved in this particular project, which is very exciting. So workers from the Marin City Community Development Corporation are out there, local financiers. And then over the construction period, we're talking about 25 jobs. And uh, and that's that's pretty uh, pretty neat stuff. So this is just something I wanted to touch on very, very briefly. I think all of you are familiar that there, uh, with the idea that there's a division of responsibilities between MEA and PG&E. MEA has nothing to do with the interconnection pro process, which is uh, a big deal for feed-in tariff projects. And so uh, there are resources available to these developers that are interested in interconnecting the PG&E system. Uh, there is a formal process that exists, and for folks that are interested in going out and situating projects within pg e service territory, which would ultimately serve MCE customers through our feed-in tariff. There are resources available. There's a number here, a website, and if they're prepared with the general location of the project, they can get a lot of good information back from pg e in terms of uh, interconnection points and other issues that are, that are really kind of key to the whole discussion. So, uh, this is just a, a bit of a reca recap here. As far as the feed-in tariff is concerned, I mentioned before it was launched as a pilot project to ensure the highest level of flexibility and adaptability. Um, certainly changes can and should be incorporated based on your input, the input of stakeholders, uh, which, which include developers and, and, and the public. And uh, 
and, and one of the things that we really need to overcome when thinking about the feed-in tariff is the idea that there are, are very limited development opportunities here in Marin. Uh, so we need to create a program that provides the appropriate price incentives uh, for the developer and then also for our, for our rate payers ultimately. And that, that gets to the question you were asking about how that's folded in kind of the, uh, the rate discussion as well. So MEA is growing. Should the feed-in tariff grow as well? And really, there shouldn't be a question mark. It's more like an exclamation point there. Um, so if we go to the, the last slide, which uh, which is really what I wanted to, to leave you with today, uh, this, this is just a couple of things, uh, near-term revisions that need to occur with respect to the feed-in tariff. Uh, one is in consideration to some, some changes that are contemplated in the integrated resource plan, growing that feed-in tariff from two megawatts up to 10 megawatts, uh, largely as the result of recent expansion of the MCD customer base. Um, and then also, as we move forward and expand into the city of Richmond, we'll also need to make a key revision in that feed-in tariff to account for the eligibility of the uh, of projects in, in our expanded service territory as well. So, uh, if you go back just to the, the previous slide there. Uh, one more down, there you go. So as far as uh, pricing is concerned, I've, I've brought up a couple of things, and I think what we, we also need to do immediately uh, with the feed-in tariff is include a pricing schedule for 2014 and 2015. Our feed-in tariff right now only offers prices out through 2013. Uh, it would be my recommendation that we leave those prices for 2013 in place for 2014 and 2015 until we get that full two megawatts under contract. I, I, it just doesn't strike me it's a good idea to go out and change the pricing incentives until we really realize the, the, uh, the goals that we set for ourselves with 